In Admag, that dilapidated cliffside tower had been restored by the weird out-of-towners. The stone golem looked on from the roof of her barracks, well aware that the mysterious masked Shek was something to do with this new business. For now though, all this business did was produce a white-haired human from time to time, who would jog into town and purchase sandwiches from the local shop. Whatever happened to those work hands that the red-faced old one had recruited, the locals wondered. I ain't never seen such a useless bunch of nodes and limbs in my entire life, and I saw the pieces of shit who fucked up this life-forsaken planet in the first place, Rick was shouting at them. Deltas of sweat streaked down their scaly faces. They were all tired of the ceaseless training their new boss was putting them through, but they knew what would happen if they stopped. You get fit, or you get the stick, Rick reminded them for the thousandth time. The stick twirled in his hands, or was his entire hand twirling? When you accidentally volunteered to be conscripted into the Chocolate Legion, you did it because you were the best of the best of the Drunk at Dawn Club, and I'd be remiss if I were to let you out there into the world without a real military education. War is serious shit. It's about getting down and dirty and sucking it up when things get hard, at least according to this ancient picture book. It's also about a showering. It's mostly showering, actually. Hey, she's got a stick as well, and she's getting creative. Uh, what the? Old man Watson, you ever heard of a reverse kebab? Damn, we gotta get showers invented again. Meanwhile, at Max and Canyon... That'll do it, Elena said, emerging from under the chocolate processor. You had the gurning jocket on upside down. Surprised it didn't just catch fire like that. Oh, no, that's never happened, Azumi said, eyeing the artistic flower of black soot running up the wall. I'm done making the pile, Els called from outside. He'd made a very nice pile of corpses out of the latest wave of Reaver attackers. He was taking his recent demotion to corpse carrier very seriously. She's a beaut, Jazz remarked from the wall. Just about covers your fucking stink, mate. Loving it. Thank you, strange lady. Jazz, would you mind watching your language? Izumi said with her head around the door of the chocolate factory. What the fuck? <laughs> Says you? Are you fucking gaslighting me right now? Why don't you watch your fucking language, you smarmy tart? Jazz, it's the young ears among us. Oh right, Elena can't hear us swear, but she can stab the dusties like any old jogger, huh? What? Yeah, that's what I thought. Oh, what did she think? Uh, whatever. This pleasant homely life, with all its confusing smells and reassuring violence, was destined to come to an end soon. One morning, Nuke gathered everyone at the gate and took a look over the dozen Shek he'd recruited for the Legion. They were kitted out in the gear the local bandits kindly dropped outside the walls each day as they travelled very rapidly away on the points of speeding harpoons. The cannons had kept everyone inside the compound perfectly safe, save for poor one-leg Ignacio who'd lost an arm in the ongoing wars as well. Today we march in a campaign that will go down in history, Nuke declared. We will fight them on the beaches. We will fight them on the hills and in the swamps, although I really shouldn't come to that, let's be honest. Yes, we will fight those horrible mountain goats to the very end. Nuke was distracted by Azumi whispering something in his ear. Um, I'm being told it's actually skin spiders we're fighting. What? I don't remember that. I don't know, I was blazed when I came up with this whole thing. And so will all of you loyal deserters be when we win, which will be, I don't know, after we walk there. So get hyped for that. Uh, a bottle of premium hydration medium to the first one to kill one of those eight-legged freaks. Wait, I'm being told they're not actually spiders. What the fuck are we actually doing here? Oh, whatever. Deploy the troops and let's just see what happens. Onwards! 
Onward they went, marching to the other side of the known world, which luckily was only about three days away. They used the nighttime recess to dodge the good old apocalypse laser, and arrived again at that lonely wasteland bar they'd stopped off at on their initial journey. This was the place where Nuke had gifted the local bandits a free sample of brown. Seemed like sound marketing at the time. Now, the Chocolate Legion was face to face with the Chocolate Horde. Brown man! Brown man! Gives that jockey! A scruffy vagrant called from outside the bar. First hit's free, second hit's double price. You know the rules, Nuke shouted back. Rules were made to be broken. Yeah? Uh, what if the rule was that you always had to break the rules? Gears uh, 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 jockey! Bread bandits, get em! From behind every tree, rock and withered cactus, more scrawny, salivating wasters appeared. Isaiah, want to try them out? Nuke asked. Isaiah nodded, placed Choco safely on his shoulder, and raised his sword. Chocolate Legion, form up! The legionaries gathered around him. Chocolate Legion, stand ready! Isaiah called. Each Shek produced a handful of choco bread and held it carefully in front of their mouths. Consume, Brown! At this order, they scoffed it down in a single bite. Suddenly, they were quivering with energy, and rumor has it some of their horns were even wriggling back and forth. By the left, kill everyone! Isaiah ordered and the battle cry that followed echoed across the wastes like the birthing of a great vengeful deity. The legion was outnumbered two, perhaps three to one, but that meant nothing when the brown mist clouded their eyes and bandits fell like stalks of sweet, sweet cocoa. It was truly a sight to behold. Everyone beheld it so hard they almost missed the fact that a beak thing had come over to see what all the fuss was about, and was currently walking off with Gustafsson in its mouth. This was resolved swiftly, bringing the military action to a close. Incredible. We've got this man, Nuke remarked to Isaiah. I do hope so. There is just one thing I feel is a bit off. Yeah, we need to do like a special pose after each win. No, I was going to say, it's the name. I rather think this Chocolate Legion doesn't strike fear into one's heart. Fine, call them Choco Rockers. Whitehorn and the Shekrek Supremes. The Fantabulous... No, Prince Tashino, I was thinking something a little more traditional. Yeah? Well, what does Shek normally call stuff like this? The soldiers are known as the Hundred Guardians. Each one aims to be a match for one hundred foes, like old Kral, you see. Then, my man, I hope you enjoy commanding your new army, the Thousand Guardians. <laughs> oh, well, that'll do. And so, the Chocolate Legion was disbanded, and the Thousand Guardians were born. The Thousand, by the way, was later taken to refer not to their worth in regular soldiers, but the number of calories per mouthful in their secret combat stimulants. After another day and a half of slogging, this army was peering at the towering cliffs of Admag. Isaiah closed his faceplate and took the lead. As the gang clattered through the streets, all were whispering of the mysterious masked Shek. They say he's from a strange land with unclear zoning regulations, one rumor went. They say he's three inches taller in the morning than at night, another claimed. They say that truth is stranger than fiction, but when it comes to Shek, both are just as dull. The force reached the restored tower and reunited with the caretakers within. Red Rick presented his group of recruits to the Thousand Guardians. I worked it out, man. You gotta hit them just right to activate all those old enforcer genes makes all the fighting we bred into him come back clear as the last sober morning, you know? Oh, you don't know? Oh yeah, that's a secret. Uh, uh nope, I don't know where Shek come from, but I'm sure glad they're here now. Enjoy them, folks. Jeans? Didn't I read something about jeans? Zumi mused. They're like your two-way lake tubes there, but kinda rough and shitty. That's all there is to it, uh, not that I remember. 
There's got to be a way to turn down the volume on this voice, Rick said. Regrettably, fielding this army had left the guild nearly bankrupt, and so the truth of the matter was out of anyone's price range. It was time to start remedying that situation. Nuke stashed a load of the brown bread in their new depot and gave the rest to Uzziah. Remember, point at the dog and tell them it'll get sad if they don't buy it, Nuke advised. What? She'll get sad? Then that settles it. I'm selling it all right now, Isaiah declared, rushing out to the town. Choco enjoyed the ride on his shoulder, and everyone who witnessed it nodded knowingly, smugly muttering something to the effect of, I knew he had a brown dog. It was beyond their wildest dreams. Within an hour, Isaiah had sold out and the local bars were full of raging brown addicts. Mission accomplished. But the real mission, and indeed the real money, was yet to be handled. That evening, the Grand Expeditionary Force was assembled at the city gate. Nuke and his companions numbered a dozen or so, the Thousand Guardians the same again, and another dozen of Nuke's hired troops bolstered them further. This gathering force had attracted a crowd of onlookers. Isaiah stood on Bobby and Claw's shoulders, with Choco still on his own shoulders of course, and addressed the locals. People of Admag, I was once told I could never return to this city, the place of my birth. So I wandered far and wide. In the far distant great desert, I met this prince of the empire, Nuke Tashino, a flat skin. He showed me what it means to live free and what marvelous things can be achieved when those from all corners cooperate. He gave me the strength to return here, but I do not break the terms of my exile lightly. I am here as the masked Sheik for the last time. I will return as the victorious slayer of the Bugmaster, a worthy warrior of this great kingdom, or I will never return again. That I promise. As Isaiah was lowered, the crowd chanted, In the image of Kral he walks, with the honor of Kral he shall die. Isaiah put his head in his hands and gave a long sigh. You okay, man? Nuke asked. Better by the moment, Prince Tashino. Thank you for giving me a day like this, a day I hardly deserve. Man, just wait till we get back with the bug, Mulder. We're gonna paint this town white. Isaiah nodded, pulled his sword from the ground, and pointed out at the distant mountain of death, glinting orange in the evening light. Thousand guardians, follow me, he called, and the procession began, watched in austere silence by the townsfolk. They used the oncoming fall of night to safely cross the spider plains under cover of darkness. At midnight they reached Last Stand, where final preparations were made. And by that I mean they drank the bar dry. This seems kind of serious, Nuke Prince. Is this really okay? Izumi said. Yeah, sure. We'll do it. Nuke shrugged. What if something happens? Dunno. If you die, you won't need to worry about it, will you? Nuke! Sorry. Yeah, I know. But seriously, I'll make it work. I'll keep you out of the mess. You're the one pulling me into this mess, actually. Uh-huh. Pulling, or are you just gripping on to me? Nuke, I really hate you, you know? Yeah, yeah. I hate you too. Forget the speaker volume. Gotta find a way to turn off these microphones, Rick remarked. At least they said something. Well, the opposite of what they're meant to be saying. But hey, opposite's pretty close, right? Boolean value's better than null. What? Oh yeah, y'all ain't got these binary brains. Don't mind me. Rick went unminded, but meanwhile, Els was attracting attention. A few of the old Shek who had been in the bar before recognized him. Chubba, there he is again. How many times you gonna come up here and run away, traitor? One asked. I, I just didn't want to go up there on my own, Els said. My friends are gonna win, and I'm gonna help. If I did that, I'd have beaten you, wouldn't I? <laughs> Numbers dilute the honor, Chubba. And these flat skins here, they soil it entirely, fool! Oh, fuck off, Crinkles, Nuke interjected. 
Numbers and friends were what your bloody Kral didn't have, and he got iced like everyone else. Even if we weren't going to get high as the bloody eye, we'd still win. Haven't you read the classics? Tomoda Ichi. The power of friendship. I might be a flat skin, but if we look out for each other, it'll tip the scales in our favour. Huh? Scales? Like, whatever, uncultured gaijin. This proved to be a great time to set off, so they left that last moat of safety and set foot on the blackened mountainside. Sandor took them via an easier route up the eastern slope, where the hills were long and shallow, both up to the crater's edge and down into it. The upward journey was quiet, with not a spider nor a shack in sight. Not that they could see far, with it being the early hours of the morning. It might seem irresponsible, but the plan was to get a full day of light to conduct their grand battle once they reached the Bugmaster's citadel. The fighting would start far earlier than that, though. They walked along the top of the crater to its southwest corner, where Sandor pointed out a quick way up towards the ridge leading to their quarry. To get there, they had to descend towards a red river down a slope patrolled by the skin spiders. With a running charge, they quickly cut a path all the way down to the water's edge. Ah, see, it's easy, Nuke remarked. Should have kept your hooting down. The Bugmaster will know we are coming, Sandor said. Indeed, the sounds of battle had echoed around the crater's many crags and valleys, travelling who knows how far. There was no time to waste. Unfortunately, they had to swim across a stretch of river to get to the foot of the Bugmaster's home ridge. Oh, cannot. I will remain here, Gustafsson said. Why, come on, Nuke replied. It is the wrong colour. Not this again. Right, up you go. Nuke had Gustafsson sit on his back while he paddled across. Luckily, the hiver weighed very little, and Nuke was a strong swimmer after his days in Manx Sand frolicking in the lake just up the Westwood Canyon. Oh, there was frolicking all right. I'll tell you about it sometime. Rick was the first to cross, and the only one who didn't swim. He was rather heavy, you see, but waterproof handily enough. Imagine being full of air, the indignity, he commented as he waited for the slow-swimming Shek to gradually struggle to the western bank. From said bank it was a short climb up to that loamy ridge, which in turn led right to the Bugmaster's gates. Strangely, all was quiet. The citadel and the route up to it looked completely deserted. The only sign of life was a twitching Second Empire Iron Spider, which had clearly been recently thrashed to pieces by its modern biological counterparts. My prince, don't you think this is a little suspicious? Wodgden said. Yes, my man, is this even the right place? Nuke replied. Sandor pointed up at the citadel, which had the word bugs painted on the side in blood. For such a short word, it was stunning how poorly it had been spelled. They're not even bugs, Izumi huffed. We might have caught him napping. Narco's blessings, perhaps, Isaiah suggested. Whatever the case, we need to play it cool, and Nuke began. However, with a sudden cry, some of his hired goons ran off towards the tower. The legendary treasure, it's so close, one called. It was true that the Shek all firmly believed the Bugmaster to possess indescribable riches, and with the coast looking clear, it was hard for a sellsword to resist. Fool, leave them, Gustafsson said. No man left behind, Nuke declared, and with this, a great charge upon the citadel began. They reached its foot, and ascended a winding concrete ramp to reach the upper levels. A few skin spiders were milling about towards the top, and really did seem rather taken aback to be suddenly assaulted of a misty morn. To the extent that a wild, flailing mess of skin and spikes can be interpreted to be taken aback, that is. A handful were cut down, and a half dozen more met the crew at the entrance to the main dome at the ramp's summit. They had some friends too, small maroon crawlers that scuttled about between the invaders' legs. Blood spiders, don't let them skewer you, Isaiah called. That didn't sound very nice, and so special care was taken. Soon the ground floor was cleared of hostiles. There was a ramp that led up to a higher chamber, 
And there, sitting in a golden bathtub, was a man with rippling muscles, a jawline that could cut steel, and voluminous slicked-back hair. The crew gathered around him, but he paid them no attention. Everyone wanted to say something about the fact that the bath was filled not with water, but with human teeth. But you know, in the moment, the right reaction to that just didn't spring to mind. Uh, excuse me, is the Bugmaster in? Nuke eventually asked him. Yep. I don't do flat skins, though, the man replied. Oh, well, would you mind if we killed you? Ah, oh, no, sorry, I've got things to do, ain't I? Can't go dying. Haven't died in centuries, you know. Centuries? You look, uh... Ah, it's the teeth. Teeth is the thing, eh? Oi! Where's the treasure? One of the sellswords shouted. The Bugmaster stood, teeth chattering down his body. He was wearing something on his lower half, to the relief of some and the disappointment of others. He held out a handful of pearly, used-to-be whites. Priceless, he remarked taking great pleasure in letting the teeth slide between his fingers and fall back into the bath. Well, I mean, we've got things to do as well, so can we? Nuke said. Give us a flash. Uh, oh, sure, check these babies out. Nuke gave the wide man an equally wide grin. After inspecting it, the Bugmaster reached into the bath and pulled out a long, gleaming blade. All right, he said, suddenly slashing out and commencing a fight. The Bugmaster was a rather beefy customer. He was as strong as a Shek, but much faster, and if his own claims to longevity were to be believed, his rippling abs attracted the glares of a curious folk who were a few hundred years too young for him. Even with these distractions, though, the twin blades of Nuke and Desire were nothing to be trifled with. Everyone else who approached was smashed away, but these two held their ground, parrying and feinting, ducking and sweeping, stabbing and cutting with everything they had. Cheered on by the rest, their energy was unending, while the Bugmaster gradually slowed. Finally, the point of Nuke's sword crossed the Bugmaster's chest. As the Hulk stumbled, Isaiah body-slammed his back and floored the giant at which point everyone was on him like a swarm of actual bugs, tying him up like actual spiders. It was done. Or was it? In the madness of the fight, a ring had slipped from the Bugmaster's finger. Afterwards, as everyone looked around the strangely empty citadel, Rick had stepped on it. Oh, did I drop this? Looks like it fits in here he said, slotting the ring into a perfectly sized gap in his arm. It hummed and span around a moment, then a little door slid closed over it. There was a spine-crawling series of rattly shrieks coming from far and wide outside. What the fuck was that? Izumi said. Oh, probably nothing, Rick explained. Ain't gonna be anything to do with the mind control device. I mean, how would I even be able to control them if I wasn't there when we... Oh, wait. In fact, I think I'll roll this back to my earlier assessment. It's probably nothing. Everyone get your weapons ready and stuff, but it's nothing. Yep. Knew I should have downloaded the manual for this shit. It wasn't clear what Rick meant, of course. But we now know that the long and short of it was, it was going to be much harder to get out of the Bugmaster's lair than into it. The real battle was about to begin. One by one, Gustafsson picked the teeth out of the golden bath and popped them into his mouth. It has the crunch, he reported to Ren, who also came over for a snack. Gary dipped his head in and trawled out a great pool of teeth, shattering them with huge bites, sending a wave of wince through the rest of the guild. They were already on edge, having just heard a strange shrieking sound echo across the mountain. Nothing to worry about, coming in hot at seven o'clock, Rick called from the window. Nuke had just finished hoisting the squirming bugmaster onto his shoulder. We've got the goods, grab a handful of teeth for the road and let's roll, the prince ordered but it was not going to be so easy. Not only was Gary hogging all the teeth to himself, but the ramp exiting the citadel was crawling with a fresh wave of skin spiders. Thousand Guardians, time to surpass even Kral. We'll fight our way out and claim victory, 
Isaiah shouted, leading his troops into the mess of sharp, muscly legs and waving stomach arms. Nuke's goons fought at their side, and a path out of the citadel was opened up. After fighting in and out, many of the combatants were wounded, which slowed their escape dramatically. My prince, since you are able, you should go on ahead, Watchton said. We cannot let their injuries put you in danger. Who do you think I am, Kral? Nuke retorted. This isn't about me, it's about the Tomodaiki. No man left behind. Future girl, time to work your magic, my friend. Who is a girl? Azumi had prepared splints for just such a case as this, but after patching the army up as best she could, they were still crawling back east along the ridge. Isaiah suggested they solve it the Shek way. The Thousand Guardians applied some acceleratory dragging to any who lagged behind, and finally the group got out of the secret castle's shadow. They reached the edge of the ridge, but more skin spiders were climbing up the cliffs towards them. Some had thought they were all heading to the citadel to avenge their master, but actually they were zeroing in on the guild. More specifically, on one member of the guild. Even more specifically, on one piece of one limb of one member of the guild. Rick, being very kind-hearted for a being with no heart, tried to open the little door on his arm behind which he'd stashed the Bugmaster's mysterious ring, but it was locked up tight. Well, he tried, and there was nothing else he could do, least of all tell everyone what was actually happening. They finally made it off the ridge, but by now the sun had disappeared below the jagged horizon. Nuke did a quick roll call before they went down the hill and back to that red river, but one of his hired hands was missing. No man left behind, Nuke demanded. Ain't a man, he's a skeleton, Sandor said. Damn, you should have seen what happened last time humans started talking shit like that, Rick commented. He and Nuke found the injured skeleton some ways back, and pulled spare parts from Gary's bag to shore up his leaking tubes and sparking fibers. By now it was pitch black, and the rest of the guild nervously stood around the two surgeons. The sky was completely covered in rain clouds. The only light was from their own lanterns, but the darkness was so maddeningly thick that the orange flickering stretched only a few meek meters in any direction. The sound of rain on rock was easily mistaken for a horde of skin spider feet padding towards them. It was a tad miserable, suffice to say, and that's just for those who weren't trying their hardest to hold their blood in. Finally, the downed bot fizzled back to life. Oh, c'est la vie! Oh, wait, ah, there it is, he said, suddenly jumping to his feet as if there wasn't a big claw hole going front to back through his chest and indeed as if there wasn't a pair of pairs of hands fiddling away inside the hole. It was much less exciting than it sounds, I assure you. They finally got back on track, but then Gustafsson caught a whiff on the wind and they all hit the dirt. A gang of skin spiders came up the track they were about to go down and started feeling around in the darkness. You could hear them scritching at the rocks and occasionally making a faint raspy sound to one another. Both of the Hivers seemed to recoil when they heard it, and whispered to each other about it in private. They do feel the connection. They are not Ronin, Gustafsson was heard saying, prompting a disappointed sigh from Ren. Whatever that was about, the good news was that the skin spidery sounds faded away for a while, and the gang managed to scramble down the cliffs towards the river. There were a couple of spiders patrolling the bank, but they were quickly dispatched. All right, you've done it before, now do it again, Nuke said. Into the water they went. The previous time there was daylight, and they weren't carrying wounded soldiers on their backs, and last time there weren't any skin spiders honing in on their secret signal. At least they can't swim, Izumi commented. Red Rick emerged on the opposite bank. They can breathe underwater though, not saying I saw anything down there, but... Uh... Well, the truth became extremely clear, extremely quickly. The skin spiders were standing on the riverbed, jabbing up with their front legs at the floating chunks of meat. Fucking hell! Swim for it! Nuke shouted, but even those who made the crossing quickly found the east bank swarming with more fleshy pilgrims. Chaos ensued. Those who struggled from the river were immediately beset by spiders, and as they became injured, they dropped the already injured folks strewn across their backs. 
Then they grappled frantically with the skin spider's rubbery hoof hands and pointy feet, all, may I remind you, by fading candlelight. In the fray, Nuke was struck across the face and tumbled to the ground, letting the Bugmaster roll away from him. When he regained consciousness, the whole crew was across. Once the Thousand Guardians had splashed their way over, the battle had been won, but now the sum of the guild's injuries had gone beyond what Acceleratory Dragging could deal with. Or perhaps Acceleratory Dragging had gone too far, as Watson demonstrated in his attempts to get a Thousand Guardian named Kang out of the water. He pulled and heaved, strained and wheezed, and then, just when it looked like he'd done it, he tripped on a fallen spider, span around, and launched poor Kang a good ten meters back into the river. My man, so packing, Nuke said, wiping blood from his mouth. I'll deal with it, Rick said, stomping back into the river and catching Kang just as his armor pulled him down to the bottom. Everyone appeared to be alive, but now most were hobbling along with the heavy weight of injured comrades and buckets of teeth anchoring them all the way. In fact, only Nuke wasn't carrying another person on his shoulders. And that was the biggest problem of all. Give me back my ring, you bandits! The Bugmaster shouted from behind them. He emerged from the darkness unarmed, but that didn't look like it was going to stop him. I need that ring to get back at the bastard who did all this! Ring? What? Nuke said. Before anything else could be said, Red Rick gave the Bugmaster the stick, and he fell down unconscious. Raven lunatic! Old ring distraction line! Oldest trick in the book! Trust me, I seen that book in the first damn edition! Now let's get the fuck out of here, shall we? They did, with the Bugmaster safely riding on the nuke train again. The good news was that recovering from the skirmish at the river had taken most of the night, which Nuke had thankfully slept through, and so at last it was possible to see where they were going. They followed the river north, killing the odd lone spider still seeking its calling, and then turned east to at last climb out of the crater. There was one last hurdle to overcome, and it was the tallest of all. An iron spider was pottling about among the rocks as if looking for something and Nuke's mercenaries decided to try and kill it to get something valuable out of this whole misadventure. This was a poor decision. Three were killed before the machine gave up the ghost. These non-biological spiders were powerful, which was something the Bugmaster was keenly aware of. As the guild finally reached the top of the crater, the first clue to the Bugmaster's real goal emerged. This here is the Ashlands, Izumi said to Nuke. She was holding up a piece of paper she'd taken from the Citadel. Or THE piece of paper, it is accurate to say. The records say it's where the Second Empire carried on the longest time. People don't go there, since, you know, the whole you never come back thing. But the giant robot crabs, that's Second Empire stuff. And if there's anywhere you dig up a load of that, it's there. This guy was up to something the Ashlanders didn't like, I bet. What, killing Shek, wrangling spiders? Nuke asked. Dunno. Maybe I'll look up some stuff once we're back home. <laughs> so you're sure you're gonna make it? Of course. I would say thanks to you, but the worst part was when I thought you were dead, so not really. You thought I was dead, and you claim to be so clever. I see you're still being a piece of shit. It's only because I like you. Uh, oh. Well, that ended the conversation quickly enough. Rick was right to think that they were quite the clueless pair, and he was also right to think that it was better if this whole connection between the Bugmaster and the old Skeleton Empire was forgotten, so he let the conversation go unpunished. He never did work out how to turn off his microphones, you know. At least the journey down the mountain was a quiet one. No spiders assaulting one's body, and no awkward sunderous stuff assaulting one's processors. Things weren't so quiet once they reached Last Stand. The Shek guards flipped between being speechless and screaming like maniacs. Such was the emotion stirred up by the sight of their arch enemy in defeat. At last, the crew could take a well-earned break, getting their wounds sorted out properly, catching up on lost sleep, and cashing in on bets made with the humbled warriors in the bar. Chubba, one said to Els. It seems there was a warrior in you. Flatskins, bugmen, and an old one. I'll never understand your company. 
but I understand victory. This one is yours. So saying, he returned to Els the bucket he had yanked off his head on a previous visit. Els's wide grin disappeared behind the rum-stained wood. By early the next morning, the guild was on the road again. All were back on their feet, save for one Tiffany of the Thousand Guardians, who left a foot in the Bugmaster's hideout. Of course, their next destination was Admag, and the barracks of the Stone Golem, where for Isaiah, the greater battle was yet to come. They've defeated the Bugmaster! A guard at the gates shouted. Within moments, the whole city was jostling for a view of the heroes and their prey. The crowd implored Desire to take the news to the Queen, and it was imploration much needed. Man, I'll go with you. Let's sort this out, huh? Nuke said to him. Prince Dashino, I don't deserve it. But I can't say I don't want it. Let's go, Isaiah replied. He pulled his helmet off and marched with Nuke to the royal barrack. The rest of the crew were told to wait outside, joining the cheering crowds. The warriors inside were silent, simply staring at the Bugmaster hanging over Nuke's shoulder. Nuke hauled him up the stairs and found the guy he'd spoke with before, the Queen's Hand, Bayan. Word was given and is kept by all of us, Bayan said. A few guards carried the Bugmaster away to be imprisoned, then brought Nuke a Garu pack filled with strings of cats. 100,000 in all, the street value of over 100 kilograms of brown. Your company has proven itself. You will be honored as an ally of the Sheik, Bayan went on. Good, good. Empire needs allies, I expect. Empire? You are from the United Cities? <laughs> yeah, kind of a big deal over there. This man shares the same rank as I, Master, Isaiah said. Bayan looked Isaiah in the eyes, for the first time in over a decade. The memory was as clear as day. Bayan wiped his horns with both hands, looked at the sky for a moment, then bowed to Isaiah. Then we've truly hit upon a strange thing here, he said with a laugh. What can I say? At least the holy nation won't like it one bit, which means the queen shall. You should go, both of you. She awaits the hero of the day, and she wishes she could have seen you sooner, Prince Isaiah. At the other end of the barrack roof, Estata was gazing out over the crowds in the streets. She was looking about with narrowed eyes and crossed arms. The thing she was looking for now found her. Isaiah, she nearly whispered. Queen Estata, it is I, Isaiah, known as Whitehorn, the masked Shek, or... Pale skin, I return to war. His eye was cut off by his feet leaving the ground and the world around him suddenly spinning. It was Astarta's doing, of course. I'm so sorry, she said. Yet at once I am unforgivable, my boy. Let it all be purged from history, lest I be buried under it. Now, really, it, it's okay, I've held my own. Which only proves my guilt. Oh, as I flying bull, what good is an excuse? My queen, my mother, it is all right, Isaiah said, but he couldn't keep his composure. Isaiah's done more than his duty, right? Nuke said. I think it's time you ended this whole pale skin thing, whatever it is. He's the prince here, no ordinary one either, because he's here the hard way, you know? And look, he's got a dog. Look into its eyes and say you aren't going to let Master go home. Estata took a look at Choco, then a longer look at Isaiah, who was held up in front of her face. Then she carried him over to the roof edge and held him up in the air like a baby. Behold, she called out, this is White Horn Isaiah, first child of my house and prince of our kingdom. He is from the mold of Kral and carries that honor with him always. I was wrong to turn my back on him. Hear this, the curse of pale skin is no more. Narco does not scorn this prince. He is favored more than any of us, so his deeds have proven. Let the lies wash away like the great sea and reveal the nourishing land below, the bedrock of our kingdom, our strength. It shall always be said that the curse was lifted this day. 
and the stolen prince returned. Hail, Isaiah! Amid the cheering, Isaiah was returned to his feet and gave an uncomfortable wave to the people below. His people, it could be said. Associate with him! Gustafsson was calling, standing on Wren's shoulders. Bravo! A fine example indeed, Wadston commented. Now that's a swell reception for a man of the world, Rick said. If only I could be so lucky. If only we really could forget. Made my own bed, huh? The victory slash reunion party commenced. Istata received the whole TCM Plus guild as honored guests, showering them with a variety of chewy cactus lumps and rum so volatile that a drop of it seared a patch of paint from Rick's face. What was he doing drinking rum? It might not do anything for a skeleton, but he had an image to cultivate, you must understand. Joining the party was the kingdom's existing heir, Princess Seto. So, you're older than me, she pouted. Yes, but don't worry, my kin, this is just a visit from me, as I said. Setting things straight, then I'll be back to business. What's your business? Oh, you know, corpse carrying, map reading, adventuring, really. With those outsiders? Yes, yes, only recently, but more's the shame. What a time we're having. You don't... is it really better out there? Better? <laughs> Depends on how you look at it. Uh, for you, Kin, I would say you'd best keep up with your reading and weights. No place for a toddler. But it's something else, this world. The kingdom's just the start of it. And the Shek, too. Just smoke from the mountain. I'll show it all to you one day, I promise. So, you'll come back? Of course. I didn't grind my teeth down over this whole affair for just the single visit. <laughs> I intend to be a fully-fledged Prince of the Kingdom. But a prince in the fashion of one, Nuke Tashino, a prince of the kingdom and beyond it. After all, that's where we need to be to get this planet back on track. I don't know what you're talking about. You'll find out once you're old enough to help him, Istata said. Mother, I, I think Seto should remain with you. Nonsense. My children are going to make the world a better place. I've listened to your empire, friend. Sounds like you're a cut above the usual crew. Except, I don't really understand this brown bread thing. Oh, it's... well, just don't eat it, no matter what anyone says, all right? Royal treasury's empty enough with that bounty, eh? It's not really honest work, but it's one step at a time, the path to righteousness, you know? <laughs> Overall, we have something resembling a happy ending here. That's one exiled prince, unexiled. Just nuke to go. Well, Gustafsson is kind of a prince, or he was, or something, so maybe two to go, if he wants. And what was Red Rick muttering earlier? Well, the more immediate concern was finding a shop that sold spare legs and going back to the drawing board on Nuke's sidelined mission to get a decent flow of drugs into his dad's house. As it just so happens, their exit from the Shek Kingdom quickly revealed the solutions to both. On the roof of Admag's royal barracks, the TCM Plus Guild bid their goodbyes to Queen Astarta of the Shek Kingdom. After a decent bug-busted celebration due, it was time for the busy business folk to buzz. But two guests in particular did not join the procession out into the street. They hadn't said a word for the whole thing. Or in fact, as long as Nuke and company had known them. I speak of Bobby and Claw, as I as guards. They waited on either side of the barrack gate, and as Estata passed them, she stopped also. I knew this was your doing, she said with a smile. The pair said nothing. You are more than any invincible has ever been. You kept your vow. So, please, be released from it, worthy ones. Thank you, Claw said. Wait, said? What's all this? The rest of the gang didn't know anything about all of this, so I'm really being very cheeky even letting you know this much already. Bobby and Claw stayed with Azaya, loyal bodyguards as ever, and as a result, Estata felt only a trifling sorrow to wave her son off down the mountain. 
her invincibles would not fail to return him in one piece. Where was the guild going? They were one leg short of full complement and had a recommendation for a discount limb joint just to the north, Hiva territory. The place was one of a number of fragrant pulpy pods perched alongside the Vane River. Similar villages ran up and down the river, and together formed the Great Western Hive, which was of course orders of magnitude less great ever since Gustafsson had bid them farewell. The discount leg store had a wide selection of old lengths of metal tube welded onto ancient tin cans, and if that isn't a discount leg, what is? While Tiffany tried to walk with the extra 0.2 of a leg she'd been given, Nuke shopped around for a little of the good stuff. Brown was the wrong colour, as any good hiver would tell you. I need green, but like a huge amount, Nuke explained to a trader. A gargantuan amount, an amount fit for an emperor, an emperor who's really in deep with the whole scene, you know? You have described the amount you need too many times, please rephrase, the hiver said. I need lots of hashish, like more than a bucket. Humans cannot consume that quantity of hashish. It has an accumulative toxic effect. I know, I know. Look, where do you get hashish from? I grow hemp in my latrine. I mix hashish in my other latrine. It is from the latrines. Holy shit. Brown, green? By Ocran's clippings, I didn't need to hear that. Look, you mad bugger. First, I'd like to say that your sales technique needs improvement. And second, I know that this shid grows in stuff other than shid. So where the shid's the shid, shid for brains? Excuse me, Gustafsson interrupted. The former prince came over and touched the trader on the shoulder. You will perish there. Good, the trader said. Prince Tashino, he knows. The Great Swamp. It is the place most similar to his latrine. That is the habitat for the plant. Come. Cool. Thanks, man, Nuke said, following Gustafsson out. I mean, are you guys like magic or something? From one hiveless one to another, how could you hope to understand? I don't know. Can you erase memories? Sure, do it all the time. Forgot it all, Rick said. He was being massaged by a harem of hivers, his eyes flashing erratically. We're going, coin slot. Well, if you're going, then I'm coming. Oh, I'm too much, really, I am. He really was. Following the hiver intel, they marched back to Admag, then to Squin, and finally entered one of the many canyons of the border zone. There was a certain canyon which every Sheik knew one should never follow, for it led to somewhere quite foul. There it is, the swamp, Isaiah reported. They were walking along a track in that very forbidden canyon. Ahead there was a sudden onset of fog, and strange shadowy tendrils stuck up from the ground, arcing this way and that. The ground was mushy and wet, like at good old Manx sand, but this was more like Manx mud. Is this like the other place where the water's made of fire and stuff? Nuke asked Rick. As if I would know, as if I had anything to do with it, was the reply. Nuke didn't feel like another classic Red Rick argument, so he just took his chances. As his sandals splat down into the moistening mud, there was only the pleasant oozing of lively swamp juice between his toes. Great. What's the deal here anyway? Doesn't seem that bad to me, he said. This is the edge of the old lands, Isaiah said. He made it sound like that was the definitive answer, but it didn't mean much to the non shek There are people living here, right? Outcasts. Criminals too edgy for the Outlands, Izumi said. I too have heard tales of the swamps, Wadston said. Dangerous beasts, murderous gangs, labyrinthine trails scattered with quick mud, sinkholes, and my prince. Nuke had already strode on ahead. The perfect place to hide your green from the samurai, he proclaimed. He was absolutely right, by the way, but even a stopped clock gets a few calls close to the mark now and again. There were trails through the thick, smelly undergrowth that the crew could follow deeper into the moist maze. Tall trees grew up from the waterlogged earth and covered the sky with a misty canopy. Deep pools of water were dotted all about, with eerie spiky shapes stalking below the surface. 
it was more lively than the deserts, one supposes, but far less inviting for it. No crabs though, so that's something. After a sticky march through two hours of continuous drizzle and fear, the crew crossed a dry hill, then descended into a small ring-fenced village. There really were people living in this dingy swamp, and oh how they were living. Drugs and fish! Get your drugs and fish! A seller called to the group from their little market shack. Fag, you serious? Nuke said, rushing over. No laughing matters, drugs and fish. I, you can have a little fun with one, and a lot of fun with the other. But I'm a professional, I'll have you know. Now then, I will stuff these three fish with grass and put them down your trousers for ya, if you let me have a little peek while I'm there. Uh, you don't take money around here? Oh, sorry sir, you're from the Skylands, are you? Ah, money it is then, sir. Didn't realize you had such sophisticated taste, sir. I love your air, sir. Fish full of grass, sir. It'd be cheaper half the price, I tell you. And I haven't even thought of the price yet, so you know I'm being honest, sir. Nuke was sold, and very quickly the vendor was sold out. It wasn't enough for his imperial needs, but it was served creatively, and that's the sign of a true greengrocer. There's another one, another one! Nuke excitedly reported to the guild. Yes, he had been tipped off that just down the road was another well-stocked village. And by road, I mean three-inch width of mud in between lakes of man-eating critters. And by village, I mean a series of large buckets filled with humans suffering from a certain accumulative toxic effect. It was a wonderful day out down the shops, all in all. However, some local ruffians seemed set on spoiling it. Beside a mercifully wider part of the road, a gang of soaked swordsmen burst from a nearby pool. Come to the wrong swamp, city slicker, one called out. Is there another swamp you'd recommend? Nuke replied. Uh, yeah, there's a spot over on the other side of... Oh, wait, they always get me with their words, they do. Die and give me your money, you tourist. I'm a highly respected businessman, Nuke said, killing his conversation partner with a clean katana swipe. The attacker's mates didn't do much better. Clearly people came by often enough for there to be a living to be made as a highwayman. Soon they found out why. They went from one kind of tourist trap to another as they arrived in the beautiful resort of Mudtown. I can hear the jangle, a hiver shouted as they entered the glamorous ring of huts and scrap. Jangle must gamble! Jangle must gamble! Jangle must gamble! Nuke echoed, going over to the Hiver's big tin casino, sat on stilts above a stagnant grey pond. You know how to play, the dealer said at the main table. He was a dealer of one thing or another anyway. Sure. Would you rather have no legs but trees for arms, or no arms but trees for legs? Nuke said. Nonsense! Either option is ideal. Speak not. Gamble your jangle at once, the dealer demanded. He was pointing at a set of beetles in a box beside him. Will there be roll, or will there be clack? Let's roll with it. What? You're so uncool. Roll! Hit me with a roll! He bets for roll! The dealer shouted. The other patrons of the den, who were mostly hivers also, all conferred privately on this fateful decision. Now let the chance dance begin! He pointed again at the beetles. The beetles seemed to understand their job, and began walking around in a circle, one behind the other. Then the dealer reached under the table and produced a cut-out piece of an ancient picture book. He placed it in the middle of the bug circle, and declared, Waifu roll, trash clack, bug truth, snap! The beetles turned to look at the buxom humanoid feline pictured on the cutout, and then began to make ticking sounds and walk backwards in a shaky, overdone fashion. Nay, nay, it is trash! Clack, clack, clack! The dealer announced, sweeping coins from Nuke's hand with well-practiced dexterity. Fug, I... did I lose? Nuke said. Rick appeared beside him. Let me try something, he said. I'll put two stacks on a roll right now. The dealer reset the table and produced the next sample picture. It looked a bit like a crab, only with long flowing hair, complete with plaits and a bow. The beetles carefully scrutinized the piece. Then, as Rick was seen scratching his arm, 
The beetles jumped onto their backs and rolled from side to side, waving a leg in the air. Rolling whip! This is the ship! The truth is revealed and the gentleman wins! The dealer said. How about that? Rick won enough to overturn Nuke's loss, with enough change left over to buy Gustafsson a present. One of the hivers there was a sword for hire. Back out in town there were fresh market stalls and shop-like sheds to visit, and here the mother load to load Nuke's father was found. Mate, you got any illegal drugs? Nuke asked the shopkeeper. Is there any other kind? The man replied, opening a chest that was packed with neat cuboids of deep mottled green. Narcos, tapeworms. I need this, but like, over and over again. Where are you getting it from? Ah, uh, I can't go telling you that, can I? But don't you worry, my munchy little man. I can supply you with enough stuff to, say, picking a purely hypothetical example, get a very rich and powerful man to give you all his property in a binding contract before all the lords and ladies of a hypothetical polity or state, my man. Whoa, that's roughly, very approximately. I know exactly what you mean, my man. See that tree back there? Hollow on the inside, it is. And it's packed full. We'll be on the bloody Fifth Empire by the time I run out of stock, won't we? The Promised Land had been found. Nuke bought some hundred kilograms of the good stuff. He would have got more, but poor Gary had to carry all this, along with an indescribable assembly of other junk. Then something really strange happened. Nuke unwrapped himself from his ninja cosplay outfit. Oh, he stopped being invisible all of a sudden, Isaiah commented. Yes, my man, I am no longer going to hide anything. I am a drug dealer, and I'm proud of it, Nuke announced. I bring happiness, addiction, and the spirit of justice. Low prices for the low, high prices for the high, and I assure you, the high will pay anything. The Nuke Tashino International Green Team Power Pipeline is founded. Cheers all round, I expect. Even Azumi was somewhat impressed, although I think that might have been because under all those raggedy sheets he'd been wearing, he was actually not so hard on the eyes. Could she convince him to remain out of costume for long? Best take a picture while it lasts, eh? Anyway, the word in the markets was that this tourist trap wasn't even the place where serious businessmen did their serious business, for the serious stuff was actually in the next town over, the capital of the swamp, known as Shark. As a result, there was no luxury hotel on the Mudtown Strip for the guild that evening, and they all plodded down the so-called path to this so-called capital. Shark was a real swampers town. And by that, I mean people were fighting in the mud pretty much non-stop over this, that and the other, and the fish and drug traders shouted out over the din of battle to hawk their wares. Worried about that lost leg? <laughs> Wad a green on a stick and a slippery fish, bargain at 500 cats ago, cures death, 9 out of 10 sciencers agree, and the last one's always a fucking straight-edge narc anyway. Once Nuke was done buying, he asked about wholesale retailers and franchising rights, and was pointed to talk to the leader of the best drug smugglers this side of the tree tree, the Hounds. Her name was Big Grim, and her residence was a large iron disc on stilts in the south end of town. Proceeding through the constant brawls to reach it, Nuke found it filled with burly, heavily armed types, eager to inquire after what exactly Nuke was looking at, and show further interest in any problems he might have, going so far as to kindly refer to him by the title Wise Guy. Lovely chaps. From among them, Big Grim emerged. Another fish out of water. Tourist. The store's across the jetty, she said. I been, look, Nuke said, showing off his I Love Drugs souvenir pin badge. You're quite the chump. Now fuck off, Grim demanded, but Nuke was undeterred. He'd of course faced this kind of customer service before. Actually, Mrs. Big, I'm looking to purchase a few hundred keys of hashish. Oh, well how am I meant to know you're not some UC narc? Upper class? United Cities! Oh, oh, that's what that stands for. Well, that explains some stuff. So you're an idiot? Just the way I like him. Look, kid, if you want to deal with the big girls, you've got to pass the test. Grim gave Nuke a bundle of the good stuff. Easy job, then we'll make a deal. You sell that in the UC, come back, and if you haven't knocked out or being fucking enslaved, then yeah, I'll listen. And uh, what'll it cost you to get me to tell you exactly how you make this stuff? 
For you? All the money in the world. Do you accept payment in human teeth? What the fuck? Sorry, having trouble with the currency exchange stuff. Indeed, the Bugmaster's priceless teeth of youth were barely being accepted as legal tender anywhere, but this was still a promising lead. With the help of the world's leading monoculture gardening enthusiasts, maybe Nuke really could bring about his green revolution. And like any good movement, it was to begin with a crime. When he told the others of the plan, they were all quite relieved. Then I shall plot a course back to the Great Desert. It would be good to return home, Watson said. Yeah, could pick up my stuff from Heft, maybe, Izumi said. <laughs> and off a few manhunters for good measure, Isaiah added, but Nuke shook his head. Guys, we don't need to go that far, we can just go to the other Empire. There's another one? Els asked. Yeah, yeah, you didn't know, down the south coast. I heard they all died long ago, Elena said. No way, my auntie went down there, it's a thing, Nuke assured them. He's right. I passed through it just a few years ago, Isaiah said. It was the most awful land, a land of death, and that's saying something, eh? But I saw samurai and empire flags here and there. I'm telling you, it's all good, Nuke said. I mean, why not have a little something on the other side of the world for a rainy day? Rainy day? Forget that. Do you even know what united means? Izumi asked. Sure, means they hate other people a little bit more than they hate each other. <laughs> then there is hope for a human Shack Alliance yet, Isaiah remarked. So yes, the group set off, even though it was still dark, heading south towards this rumoured other United Cities Empire. Fortunately, the southern side of the swamp was a little more civilised than the north. The gangs kept the trails in better condition, probably to maintain good smuggling routes into this very same southern empire. The geography was more favourable too. While in the north, the swamp was bordered with thick undergrowth and steep cliffs, the south edge petered out gradually into a friendlier course of wetlands and freshwater lakes. Small plants and heathers flourished, growing around piles of old bones and poisonous fungi. The dominant species here was something rather special. Thousand Guardians, assemble! Isaiah called when he spotted it. Everyone rushed up to him, weapons drawn but ahead of them was a convoy of plodding swamp turtles. Thousand Guardians, by the left, appreciate the majesty of nature. The squad followed their orders. The turtles, by the way, were about 20 feet tall, standing on four huge legs, with perhaps 10 feet of multicolored shell on top. They paid the guild no heed as they wandered by. Well, that's new, Rick said. Did you see them before, Isaiah? Izumi asked. Indeed. However, oh, it's too... The swamp ninja operate here, hunting the poor creatures. Slavers, too, if there's no one to pick up on their rounds. I wonder how long it will be until they are all gone. Fucking hell, Nuke muttered. People just can't leave shit alone. They gotta eat, Sandor said. Then let them eat choco bread, Nuke declared. They carried on a little ways, and sure enough, just behind the turtle flock, there was a band of ninjas stalking them, clad in green with their faces masked. Fucking eat choco bread, Nuke shouted at them. This was interpreted as some newfangled big city insult, and a fight broke out. The ninja clearly did not have the element of surprise, and it ended poorly for them. Perhaps a turtle was saved through such careless scuffling. Anyway, they happened upon the main road into the Southern Empire, and following it really did lead them to something looking a lot like the United Cities. A small fortress was built beside a river in a little gully, and inside was the city of Clownsteady. What this name could possibly mean remained a mystery, for upon entering there was no evidence of clown tolerance. Quite the opposite, the local samurai were going house to house rounding people up and throwing them in jail. Nuke asked a guard at the gate what was going on. Oh, don't worry, sir. There was a rumour that those swamp rats have been smuggling illegal narcotics into the city. Won't be having any of that here. Not even, like, uh, a little bit. Zero strikes rule is in effect here, sir. Being a drug dealer is illegal, whether you dealt any drugs or not. So this didn't seem like the best place to fulfil Nuke's little side quest. Soon everyone resolved that they really should just go home. And soon they would. 
but not only would Nuke come up with a genius way to win the allegiance of the Hounds without getting his zeroth strike, but he would stumble across the first whispers of the ultimate secrets, the forbidden law of Grow Your Own. As such, getting home would turn into an adventure in itself. Nuke was in a pickle. He'd been asked to sell some drugs as an initiation ritual into a criminal syndicate, but the local marketplaces were under martial law. He'd never get away with it, and so he'd never get into the gang, and so he'd never get to grips with how hashish was actually produced and distributed. Then, almost waking from the dream, he was dragged back in by a stroke of genius. Guys, 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 watch this, he said to the crew. He held a block of green in one hand and a string of cats in the other. With the skill of a being with full control over at least two limbs, he swapped the items from left to right via the armpit. The sale was complete. It was an act of fraud that mixed legal and illegal as smoothly as a hiver stirs his latrine, then sells the stirring stick as a wooden leg to a passing guild, to use a randomly generated simile. Okay, but you said we could go home, Izumi complained. I know, I'll go make good with the drugs mummy in the swamp and catch up with you. I'll be back before Charlie even realizes what I did with the switcheroo back there. While the gang prepared to stay the night in Clownsteady and then head home, Nuke raced back north to the pitch darkness of the swamp. He felt extremely confident he'd be able to find his way. I mean, you just follow the little trail. And then he found himself wading waist deep through stagnant water. And then, well, it's hard to say just how lost Nuke actually got, for he himself never truly understood the depths of it. Suffice to say, at one point he found himself falling into a series of underground smugglers' tunnels and began randomly selecting which direction to take at each fork. He bought it off himself, Els realized back in Clownsteady, with no sign of his master's return. Nuke found a bit of tunnel that sloped upwards and used it to return to the surface. When he emerged, he was inside a building made of concrete and filled with industrial machinery. Bright ceiling lights flickered on as he entered, and it didn't smell of rotting flesh as much as your average swampland rain shelter. This was an old Second Empire lab, and as Nuke rummaged around a little, he uncovered assorted documents in vacuum-sealed boxes. While there are certainly more books, mangas, digital videos, images and other computerized cultural contraband, the discourse of modern academia is almost entirely free of the Earth Clan scourge, he read on one prominent sheet. He gathered up similar reports, studies and verbose fragments of old science for a certain special someone who probably would be very interested in this little stroke of luck. Most lucky of all was a map of the local area, as of about 2000 years prior. It showed the little rocky hills that Shark was nestled in, albeit labelled as Pillow Down Memorial Cemetery. Thus Nuke stumbled into the Swamper capital by morning's light. The orange dawn sun washed the darkness away and cast long dancing shadows from the hordes of drunk high locals punching wildly at each other and slash or some unwelcome figments of their imagination. Mummy, I'm home, Nuke declared in the Hound's HQ. A load of the gangsters were woken up by this announcement and weren't entirely happy about it. However, the idea of actually speaking to a perky cringe lord that early in the morning wasn't that appealing. After much waiting, Big Grim finally came out and snatched up the strings of cats from Nuke's outstretched hands. Well, looks like you passed the test. Guess you're in the gang, Grim said, but the other gangsters were shaking their heads and swiping across their necks. But you should probably fag off, alright? Come back tonight or something. No time. Got these reports on, like, the historical consensus on parasitic degeneracy in humans? I don't know, stuff. Need to go give it to my friend, who is a girl. So, can you just tell me how to make green, and I'll go take care of it and cut you in and stuff? Cut me in? Who do you think you are? Me? I'm the daddy, Nuke said with a wink. 
He was forced to keep winking all the way out of town, an effect of the nerve damage Grimm's forehead had impacted upon his face. In essence, this all turned out to be a less fruitful relationship than it could have been, but that was an issue to deal with once the hundred keys loaded up on Gary were done with. Nuke ran off to meet with the guild on the road back east. The guild had set off that morning, and were currently negotiating with the local ninja and blood spiders about the relevant toll category for their party. You see, the ninja insisted they should be both killed and stripped of their possessions, while the blood spiders found the taking of possessions to be uncalled for, but did stipulate their rights to consume the bodies of the party for sustenance. It all got a bit messy. Everyone ended up brawling for hours, with only Els missing out on it, for he was embroiled in an argument with a nearby rock over who had walked into who. Nuke finally met the party on a small hill, up which the guild hobbled and trudged. Do you remember when you were history girl? Nuke asked Azumi. Yeah, heard of her. Don't know what she was thinking, Azumi said. She's gonna be thinking, oh wow, thanks Nuke, what a hero, check this shit out. Nuke presented Azumi with a partially hydrated stack of papers. What is all this? She sighed, flicking through it. The rise and fall of the first empire. Narco spiny thighs, this is... It's forbidden! Where'd you get that? Rick shouted, trying to get at the papers, but Azumi had them down her shirt in a flash, one of the few places Rick would not follow. It's history and I'm keeping it, she stated. Thanks, Nuke, that's amazing! Where did you get this? You know, just pulled a few strings, a few connections, influential man I am, and you always say I'm useless. So basically you're not going to tell me where you got these? And breach the confidence of my elite network of elite elites. Cool, so yeah, back to being useless already. Come on, we've got to get this stuff somewhere safe. The guild set off again, with Rick hovering around Azumi's payload, and suggesting everyone take their clothes off for all manner of reasons, none of which worked. On Azumi, at least. They walked east into the lovely part of the Empire known as the Bonefields. It was a simple name for a rather storied land. The landscape was littered with bones big and small. The sand was crunchy underfoot for all the bony bits within, and the horizon was striped with the silhouettes of enormous rib cages. The lonely wastes were making a very deliberate point of being devoid of life, it seemed. Alongside the bones were large stretches of old metal and half-buried ships from the First Empire. The theory is that there used to be a roof that extended over the sea, Izumi explained. Since there's so much, you know, bone here, they must have been keeping animals in this particular area for some reason. Only because they kept dying when we let them out, Rick complained. Uh, yep, that was my favourite uh, song lyric from the time, he added. Ah, yeah. Only cause they kept dying when we let them out. Yeah, baby, it's what a shout. Cause I love you so. Yep, good song. Oh, what were you guys talking about? Oh, sorry, I have my microphones off, you know. He got out of that one, and the crew got temporarily out of the bone fields for the night. This whole place was part of the United City's empire, and as such there was a large walled city on a hill somewhere in the middle of all the mess. It was called Caton, and was little more than a caravan stop for traders, with no farms or businesses of its own, yet quite the night was had there. First, the mundane part of the tale. There was a trio of hiveless hivers, Ronin as folk called them, who were very interested in not being stuck mucking garus amid the remnants of their old planet. When they smelled, sensed, in some way detected Gustafsson's big prince energy, they signed up for mercenary duty there and then. Each was given a free human tooth to chew on as a welcome gift, and they fell into line behind their new master. Then, the weird stuff started happening. Els was enjoying a private drink in his bucket, but had a strange feeling in his legs. It felt like he couldn't feel the ground beneath his feet anymore. It's the fly-in rum, his echoing voice announced, and plenty more was consumed. But alas, twas not the rum, but the ravages of time causing the disturbance. Said ravages went not to your head, but to your legs. If you're a Sheik, that is. 
What the fuck? Charlie's turned into an egg! Nuke exclaimed when he saw the damage. Els had stood from the table and now managed to be even shorter than Tiddly Azumi, albeit with his rotundity still intact. He had turned into an egg. That really was the easiest way to describe it. <laughs> I lost some weight, I did, Els proudly claimed. Is that even... <laughs> Big sister, Nuke called. Elena took a look at the curious case. I think he's... really old, was her diagnosis. I'm the oldest, Els claimed further. You're the biggest, smallest check I've ever smelled, Elena told him with a pat on the head. So what? This is just what happens? Nuke asked. Not normally, but normally a Shek would be dead by this point. So I think this might be perfectly ordinary. That's perfectly ordinary. Yes, he was twice as tall ten minutes ago. Shek grow quickly, shrink quickly too, Elena shrugged. Cool, cool. Come on, Charlie, why don't I buy the biggest, smallest Shek in the world a steak so you shrink down big and strong? Once Nuke and his big, smelly egg finished dinner, the prince noticed a trio sitting across the bar. Two women in a partial state of dress were drinking with a well-trimmed guy sporting deep black skin, bright silver hair, and an immaculate short-sleeved leather jacket over clean white turtleneck get-up. Nuke, a noble of the Empire, knew a thing or two about fashion. For example, he too wore a short-sleeved leather jacket, and the matter of who wore it better was about to be decided. Hey, punk, <laughs> nice try. Nuke said, sitting down at the offender's table. At least I tried, the guy said, running his fingers over his feather-cut hair. This wasn't the man's first fashion battle, it seemed. Nuke moved his hand to his ragged mop, but it was so twisted and knotted that his fingers got jammed in it. Removing them took so long that the other three were done laughing by the end of it. Look, jacket boy, I'm the real deal, Nuke insisted. I wear this jacket while I'm out there walking the wastes, killing weird teeth dudes, making cats by the stack and never looking back. I'm legit. You, man, are what we in the <clears throat> Imperial nobility call a poser. I don't need this from you, Dreg. You ain't ever done shit, the guy complained. Yeah? Don't have to pay girls to hang out with me. Well, technically I do. <sighs> Speaking of that, you're due, buddy. One of the girls said to the poser. The poser's hair started to become ingreased with sweat. I don't... that's not... Look, Dreg, you got money? Yeah, and a load of old teeth, Nuke said. If you want to prove yourself, then why don't we play for it? The first thing? Sure, I bet everything I have against everything you have that I'm just generally better at stuff than you. And if you lose, you can never wear a leather jacket again. Deal. You ever played Wacky Backgammon before? <laughs> Who do you think I am? Of course I've played Wacky Backgammon before. Nuke had never played Wacky Backgammon before. However, he was very drunk. Now it would take several volumes to explain the rules of Wacky Backgammon, and so the details of this epic match would be entirely lost on you, I'm afraid. All I can relay here is that being drunk gives one a distinct advantage in this curious game, and so by the end of it, the poser had lost everything, and of Nuke, the two girls had seen everything. That's really all I can tell you. In the winnings came the poser's contracts with the girls, who turned out to be strangely dressed bodyguards, which explained their thick arms and bruised knuckles rather nicely too. They were foreign and shamika, and now they were Nukes in as far as now Nuke had to pay them. Luckily, Nuke quickly thought of a use for the buxom babes. Azumi came into the bar, somewhat intoxicated already from the rest of the guild's campfire antics outside. She was looking for Nuke, of course, and of course she found him. He was walking right towards her, with nearly topless Foreign and Shamika to both sides. You can surely understand that this stirred Azumi up quite a bit, but Nuke went on with the introductions anyway. Future girl, these are my newest employees, they're like you, he said. Great start. What? Nuke, you... what the fuck are you... I'll do what you want, Azumi said. She turned to leave, but Nuke had a perfectly good excuse. No, they're for you. 
For me? What did Rick... I don't... You... You really... I thought you'd feel safer with them. Safer? You know, like as guards. Since I keep getting you into trouble and stuff. You can have these two as your guards, and you won't have to deal with any gorilla shit you get from, like, you know, guys. And they don't smell that much, and they aren't popping human teeth and whispering with mind magic and stuff. So it's a present. I'm paying. Perhaps Nuke really was being a nice guy here, but Azumi was so off-balance the other way that she didn't fully appreciate it, suffice to say. We'll keep you safe. Best in the biz, Foreign said. And even if this chump's paying us, don't think twice about asking us to take him out, you know? Yeah, say that again, Shamika added. <laughs> At least it's finally a woman client. Got any thoughts on uniforms, miss? Sure, sure, I will do. I, uh... Wait, are you... Shamika said, looking between Azumi and Nuke. Azumi ran off before further questions were raised. Go on then, go guard her, Nuke said to the pair. Sure, first things first. Foreign said, before promptly kicking Nuke in such a way that he spent the night on the floor of the bar. Whether this new development would help with the whole situation, if that's the right term for it, was yet to be seen. In the morning, in varying states of sobriety and health, the guild set out north. They followed the caravan routes into the part of the bone fields where the balance of bone and field started to favour the latter, the edge of the southern United City's empire. There, they stopped in a slow town called Morn, formerly of the Empire, but now left to squatters. It was surrounded by First and Second Empire ruins, plus its own share of bones, giving it a nice, deathly atmosphere with a less oppressive feel than Catan. Good place to grab a snack and watch beak things kill passers-by. In a store there, Nuke bought a map of the area, which Azumi examined closely. There, it's here! I knew it! she eventually said. Anything good? Nuke asked. The tech scribes. Like tech hunters, but without the hunting. They're the world experts on decoding ancient data. Perfect place for, you know. She was nodding down towards her chest. It wasn't the clearest way of getting it across, but she was of course talking about the Second Empire goodies stowed within. It took Nuke a while to realize this, but analyzing the exact contours of the communication was time well spent at least. He saw something else of interest in town also. While everyone wondered about the depressing shops, he noticed that none of the locals were going anywhere near a big Second Empire-style hall that overlooked the whole area. Naturally, he was up there in a flash. For some strange reason, the gate to get in was locked tight, chained to the ground and gateway, and smeared with messages to the effect that one should not traverse it. Naturally, the locks were broken with a smash. Inside, there was loads of old furniture and military gear, but it was strewn about the place and battered beyond use. Nothing good to steal at all, but Nuke thought he might as well check upstairs. Peering over the edge of the ramp that wound up the outside of the building, he saw that the top floor had a resident. A very peculiar resident. The sort of huge, hairy, feral beast of a resident that might just object to intrusion. As such, Nuke decided to casually return to town. There he asked in the bar if anything was unusual about the old tower. You haven't heard, the barwoman said. That's the lair of the great white gorillo. Beast of beasts. Killed Okran knows how many just getting it in there. The things we did to keep that gate locked up shut still tries to get out every night. I hate the sound of it. But that's morn, isn't it? On the edge of death, right beside our fellows in the bones across the dunes. Nuke nodded along to this fascinating local lore, but then very, very quickly gathered up the party and set off for the nearby tech scribe enclave. Izumi was impressed by his enthusiasm for academia, and indeed nobody was mauled by a giant gorilla, so scholarly pursuits were already paying off. Not for Morn, of course but they wouldn't be facing a problem they hadn't faced before. After fending off a bandit attack on the road, the guild arrived at this tech scribe enclave by nightfall. It was nicely outside of the bone fields, on a hill overlooking a damp vale dotted with lakes, or perhaps more likely, the remains of the sea that used to cover the bone-dry expanse beside it. 
similar to Black Scratch. It was a highly fortified outpost of military academics, with shops selling niche goods like books and skeleton parts. Leg! Gustafsson called, brandishing said leg over his head. Yes, he'd finally picked up a suitable limb replacement for his Yermun Ignacio back on the farm, if you were still following that little drama. Now the question was, would this place allow Azumi to get those important matters off her chest? And did they know anything about how to grow hashish outside of a riverside latrine? The answer was yes, with an exciting variety of catches. Well, 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 this is quite the little treasure trove, the skeleton said. What? Sorry, who are you? Izumi asked, quickly hiding her stack of papers from the approaching metal claws. Don't worry about him, he's the man you need, a local techie said. He's the best data storage and translation buff in the world. We had to edit his boards a bit though, to stop him deleting everything like other skeletons. Made him a little off. Side effect. Yes, and yet again we see that no matter what complaints you stupid humans have about us, it was you who made us this way, the skeleton said. His name was Enrico, and he sat in the tech scribe bar, dressed in the richly coloured robes of an imperial noble, with the patterns of the imperial house, no less, although something tells me he wasn't actually related to Nuke. Hey, hey, what's going on in there? Rick shouted from outside. Keep him out! He's trying to cover something up! Izumi shouted. The tech scribes buzzed Rick with a little device, and with routine ease dragged his collapsing body off to the maintenance shed. They ain't gonna let you live if they find out! Don't you tell them! He was shouting. That aside, Izumi gave Enrico the papers, and within minutes he had them scanned into his memory. There is a lot of new information here. These are good documents. They're good. You are Izumi of Brink, aren't you? Yes, uh, have you read my work? Izumi asked, charmed. I have, but I have read all work, so that is not remarkable. Have you read Yesuke and Rock-chan's Bumpy Ride? Nuke asked. He had to shout a little as the techies weren't letting him pass the doorway, although only because you weren't allowed to wear hats in the dining hall, and Nuke refused to part with his new black, wide-brimmed boonie, matches his jacket and his new dark sunglasses. If you think I haven't read Yesuke and Rock-chan's Bumpy Ride, then you clearly have no idea what academia even is, Enrico said, waving for Nuke to leave. These literati think that reading one light novel with a half-hearted moe themes makes them some kind of intellectual. If it's any consolation, I hate him too, Izumi said. Finally, someone clever. And yes, your work here is most fascinating. We are missing most of the pages of this history of the First Empire. That, my girl, would make your career. Will there be more? Maybe. We sometimes go to unusual places in search of a... Uh, well, you're an educated fellow, I'll be honest. We look for drugs as part of our conspiracy to usurp power in the United Cities Empire. Mainly because they were very, very bad to our friend's old dog. Ah, yes, very good. You have reached that stage already. Enrico nodded. Just how did he get that house Tashino robe, anyway? Well, for drugs, you need to go down to the lagoon. Tell them that Enrico sent you. They are academics, so they always have a little inspiration. Is that... we didn't have that in Black Scratch. That is because Black Scratch is a level 3 narc zone, Enrico insisted. He ranted about this further for some time, and then finally allowed Azumi to leave. She was paid for her services in transcribed books, excellent additions to her collection in Manxand, if they ever got home. And Nuke got this intel that the grass was greener on the other side of the lagoon down the hill. Soon he was swimming across this lagoon towards a raised metal platform on the water's edge. Standing on huge concrete legs, this Second Empire construction was host to Flats Lagoon, a little refuge for tech hunters, tightly packed with shops, accommodation and entertainment. But once the guild arrived, the entertainment fell a little flat. You've run out! Nuke scoffed. Sorry sir, you know how the pen fiddlers up there are, the barman shrugged. Uh, I thought you'd be able to supply me. This place is way easier to get to than the swamp, Nuke said. You tried to get there, did you? Yeah, and succeeded. On the way back with a shipment, but I need a lot more. And really, I need a way to grow... Uh... 
Nuke stopped speaking when he noticed the whole bar had gone silent and were all staring at him. Who said? A ship? Ship? Shipment? The barman muttered. Yeah, got a hundred keys, Nuke began, but he was at once surrounded by a clamoring crowd. They were offering him money, clothes, jewels, weapons, and certain luxurious services. Anything for a handful of the good stuff. By which I mean green. By which I mean hashish. It's not for sale! I need more of it, not less! Nuke called above the noise. I'll, I'll tell you the secret! The secret place! The secret place! The barman shouted, and others chimed in to the same effect. So, if I sell you some stuff, you'll tell me the secret? Nuke asked. He didn't ask what the secret pertained to, for that would ruin the excitement. Outside, Azumi had bought herself and her two wing women some stylish black and white adventuring suits with plate armor, making them look like proper tech hunters. And she was a proper tech hunter now, with her notes on the First Empire's relations with that mysterious place called Earth currently being poured over and analyzed by the scribes. Finally, let's go home. Watson said once it was time to go, but Nuke had that worrying smile on his face. Nope, first we're going to the secret place, he said. Secret place, my prince? Don't worry, my man, it's worth it. It's to do with drugs. It seems that everything we do is to do with drugs, my prince. That's literally life, my man, doesn't really come any different. And uh, while I'm here. Nuke bought another Garu from a gang of nomads hanging around the ramp of the platform. She, Garrett, would take the load off Gary's shoulders and increase the smuggling capacity of the group dramatically. Such things were needed because of the secret. Let's not ruin the fun for you quite yet. Let's only say that accessing the secret would require the guild to move east through the lowland lagoons and eventually up into the mountains at the other end of the Vale. And quite the mountains they were. One of them was a rather not dormant volcano, and so fog and ash kept visibility to a minimum. Going there at night didn't help either, but the nature of this secret required their presence remain a secret too. It was no secret to the land bats though. Yes, the carnivorous, highly territorial land bats, which were bats on land in as far as seahorses are horses in the sea. They were snarling, long-nosed, web-armed rat pigs with fangs and a temper. And this was their mountain. Coughing black ash, the guild had to fend off raids from these beasts as they carried on east, but finally things quietened down. Then there were some oddly linear and symmetrical shadows ahead of them. The secret! They weren't even lying! Nuke said. He took the guild between two rows of houses, numbering six to eight in all, depending on how you count the ones that were practically just piles of rubble. Nuke saw to the lock on one of the doors and crept inside. There, the promise of the Flats Lagoon addicts was kept. Green growing in brown, the colours have no clear priority, was Gustafsson's comment. He was looking at long beds of compost from which neat hemp plants were sprouting. Pipes across the ceiling supplied sprinklers, and stinky composting devices against the back wall were filled with fresh growing medium. Make your own mank! Nuke exclaimed. They brew up some slop, grow hemp in said slop, even without mank sand, and then... He looked around further. Damn it, how do they make the green? There was a brief diversion. As it turned out, the land bats had followed them into the secret drugs farm. While the crew battled away outside, Nuke was rummaging through the various machines and boxes in each building. Lots of stuff for growing hemp, but how the hashish was being made certainly wasn't obvious. And made it was, for some of the boxes were full of it. Thanks to Nuke, whoever was running this place could use that space to store something else now. It's good to tidy up, you know. Well, what's going on? Nuke asked Izumi and Elena, who had been tasked with sussing out the system. Nuke, it's five in the morning. Land bats aren't even nocturnal and they're all over us. Can't you just drop it? Izumi said. Incredibly, this appeal actually got through to Nuke, and they left the drug farm intact. You better work it out, you better! Nuke was saying to them as they walked. I know how to make it, Gustafsson offered. Not your way. That place had no latrines, man. There's a real way. Prince Tashino, have you seen this? 
Elena said. She handed Nuke a piece of paper. It was a police report, written in old-fashioned Second Empire print. Towards the bottom it read, And the suspect was having a right laugh, he was. You see, he'd rigged up a homebrew solution that was proper good, hashish by the boatload, and all he had to do was... Thus ended the page. Nuke was devastated, but he soon realized Elena's meaning. It gave him an idea for the Azumi... situation. Future girl, he said, braving the scowls of Foreign and Shamika. I was thinking that once we're done with this, I'll give you some help with the tech hunting. What sort of help? Like, we'll go wherever you want and look at all the buildings and stuff. No drugs, not even a gram. What do you think? I think... What's your game here, Nuke? I just want you to be happy. So, you want to find ancient secrets about those bloody drugs? Yes. Fuck, how do you do that? Senses, consciousness, stuff you get if you're off the drugs. Like magic, really. Ah, uh, but I wasn't really lying. Is that so? Yeah, in that I do want you to be happy. Lame! Foreign barked. She and Shamika dragged Nuke away. Azumi didn't think it was that lame, actually. The crew moved east, leaving the Ashen Mountain but still marching through barren, rocky expanses, broken up only by gloopy, polluted streams and dusty fungi. This was the depths of the old lands, as the Shek called it, the lands that were at the epicenter of whatever it was that befell the First Empire. It was precisely this event that Azumi's discovery offered a fascinating insight into. The papers had implied a fight, but that much seemed obvious given the still active space laser. Whatever it really was, it was something significant enough that not even the usual scorched ruins were to be found on those mountains. These mountains, by the way, were in the region called Stobes Gamble, which if you have a good memory you might recall was the place the guild stumbled through on their way to a destined meeting with a load of fishmen and crab salesmen. There was a way back to Manxand from here, but it passed through the so-called Unwanted Zone, a stretch of Beak Thing territory on the southern edge of the Empire. Thus, they went around it, through the quiet lowlands called Stobes Garden. It was where the coastline had been in the First Empire days, with the sudden appearance of ruined ships as you walked east, marking the exact border. Here, the guild turned north towards Black Scratch, but as they passed beside a long set of old coastal cliffs at dawn, they came upon a rare sight indeed, a real relic of the First Empire. Ah, uh, damn. He's still here, Rick muttered. What? Nuke asked, but Rick ran off ahead. The crew chased him and came upon a huge skeleton corpse, taller than the cliffs it lay slumped against. Rick was sat in the dirt staring up at it, and may I remind you that for a skeleton, sitting was wholly unnecessary in ordinary circumstances. Rick, is that... Izumi began. Yeah, we were supposed to hide him back in the 2.0 days, but you can't, can you? This guy, we owe it all to him. Rickard, is that the one you call Stobe? Isaiah asked. King Stobe, Yasafson remarked, remembering Rick's old claim. The Hivers followed their leader in lining up before the robot remains and bowing to it in turn. Yeah, that's the king. Next time you go back to that trumped-up killer library, they'll probably work the main man's deal out, since you've breaking the seal on that shit. Uh, guess I'll tell you then, so you appreciate it. Stobe saved the world from them up there. Rick pointed up at Okran or as Azumi reminded everyone again, at Earth. He stopped them. Stopped it all. Well, him and his big-ass round table. Earth clans were damn obsessed with giant fighting robots. <laughs> that was the reason they kept coming down guns blazing after all. Still, didn't expect us to actually have them. <laughs> and they were like, all right, we just got to get rid of this whole planet. And Stobe was like, right back at you, bucko. <laughs> smart missiles weren't as smart as him turn that shit around. Most of them. Huh. That was a bad day. Anyway, everybody loses, but we lose less. <laughs> and that's just the start of it. Funny what you remember when you try. Oh shit, oh shit, oh shit, oh shit, oh shit! Rick went into hysterics and started writhing about. The guild tried to calm him to no avail. 
Coin slot, what's up with you? Nuke said. Rick, please calm down. What's a missile? Rick! Zumi was saying. No one got any answer, but after a long wait, Rick seemed to calm down. It's alright. It's alright. I moved it. New storage location at random. It's out of sight. Damn. Damn, damn, damn. And there I was, thinking biologicals didn't deserve all that shit. <laughs> damn it all. Praise fucking Stobe, let's just get out of here. But uh, wait, how did Stobe die? Izumi asked. Oh, shut up. He died free, no thanks to you pieces of shit. And here I am today because of it. <laughs> Try all you like. You'll never find the documents on that shit. Even the biologicals had the sense not to write it down. Damn. I'm out. I'll see you back home or whatever. Man, I think something bad happened. Nuke said as Rick stomped off. Guess we knew that already. I think it was really bad. Poor Rick. We shouldn't have asked, Izumi said. Sounded like it was all. Like he has good reasons for not wanting to talk about it. Skeletons do not have feelings, Gustafsson said. Pretty sure they do, but they can choose different responses to mitigate them, Elena explained. And Bad Green, you can't come in here with that. You aren't the most experienced with feelings, all right? Nuke said. Nonsense! I feel hungry. Teeth, the Hiver replied. A quick snack and he was good to keep going with the walk north, following Rick's footprints right back to Black Scratch. The city was under attack by bandits, as it often was, and Nuke's strategic arrival brought cheer to all inside. Down the hill, past the outer corpse pile, over the speckled midfield corpse range, around the gateway corpse holding area, and boom, they were right back to Maxand Canyon. The guild had attracted the attention of a large band of pirates on their way to the base, but as these attackers stormed forward to stop them reaching the gate, that gate opened to reveal three big strong crabs. Prince, Krusty and Scut were all grown-ups by now, and the triple crab smackdown surprise really has no equal. Yeah, get crabbed, you spooky fags! Jazz was heard shouting from the walls. The pirates were distributed among the relevant piles, and the crew was home at long last. Time for a nice holiday, and even a little dessert. After all, the place was now overflowing with mountains of stale, sandy choco bread. Even Nuke was a little surprised at his workers' productivity. The stock was worth a bugmaster's ransom, and more. So, you get it in with the pea rinse? Jazz asked Izumi as soon as she thought she was alone. Nope. Nope. You serious? Yeah, but I don't know if he is. What? He totally is. Not that simple. Oh, for fuck's sake, he likes you, darling. Not many people like you, so you should probably take what you got, huh? Jazz was shut out of Azumi's office, forthwith. Meanwhile, Nuke was in the barrack explaining the new plan to Isaiah. Oh, it's admirable, admirable. I think Miss Azumi will be very pleased you're willing to help her with this. And I think it might be fun. Maybe we'll find out the truth after all. Not that it sounds all that appealing after the Rickard thing. <laughs> anyway, I was going to say that you really don't need to worry that much about impressing her. Yeah, I do. I think. You don't. She likes you already. Yeah, but it's hard to be sure. Got evidence to the contrary, but could it be that Sundery thing? Sundera! Rick shouted from his shed. Oh yeah, Rick got a shed. He's up to no good in there, but don't worry about that. Oh, this is quite the pickle then, Isaiah said. He was absolutely right. Obviously, there's more to be said about the uh, situation, but let's focus on the more adventurous matters that arose shortly. Elena came back from Black Scratch one day with a map some hunters had uncovered. It was a very old map, and on it there was a certain spot west of the Great Swamp that was marked Piston Police Narcotics Research Shelter. What did that mean? It meant Nuke was very happy. I know, yet another lead in this quest for drugs, which so far has been quite a tease. But I'll tell you now that this was it. The it, it. The it that would sort it out. What is it? The situation? <laughs> nice guess, but, well, uh, the next excursion would help both Nuke and Izumi answer many questions. Is anyone seeing this? Look how much is coming off! Nuke exclaimed. 
bits of tin shrapnel were scattering from the rock face every time his pick rammed its way in there. You probably think you're pretty strong, huh? But come on, you see in this? You have to be seeing this! Nuke was trying to impress some of the Thousand Guardians, who had come over to investigate the racket at the end of the base. The southwest corner of the Manx and compound had a tin vein exposed on the surface, which was of approximately zero use to anyone, and hence it is no surprise Nuke had started mining it out. I said approximately zero use, for if you really zoom in on the use graph, you'll see one possible application of the flimsy, valueless metal. It was put in the hands of one strong, infinitely valuable skeleton with a red faceplate. Red Rick had been in a bad mood ever since his recent encounter with Stobe, whose role in Rick's life was of both the utmost significance and secrecy. It was to be a secret even from himself, and so to that end, Rick had discovered a nice way to divert his processing power elsewhere. He was polishing up the tin ore, then hammering it into little shapes. These shapes, when assembled, created little model humans, faceless and dull. Perhaps that was how Rick saw his fleshy muse. Nuke was therefore trying to help his supposedly suffering star warrior, and embarrassing himself in front of the Sheik was just a fringe benefit. It wasn't the only genius idea he'd had recently. Unhappy with how the whole Bugmaster campaign had exposed many people's mortal weaknesses, he devised a genius way to make his crew a little more thick-skinned, or at least more crispy-skinned. It was as simple as it was effective. He had people taking turns sitting on top of a fire, because what doesn't kill you makes you stronger, the ancient literature claimed. Nuke pointed to Ignacio as a case study of this effect. He had lost an arm and a leg in service to the guild, but he survived, and now he had a robot arm and a robot leg to play with. Stronger! And more lopsided, but you can't expect these legs to be one size fits all, can you? Later that day, Nuke called the Zumi over to watch the fine mining. It's all in the swing, you see, Nuke explained knowingly, doing the swing with well-practiced incompetence. Great, at least you're helping Rick. I think that's good of you. Maybe he'll calm down and explain something. That bot's everything I could ever want. I told you to stay away from me, all right? Still ain't got the shit out of there from last time, Rick called from the shed. All I could want for my research? Tell me your secrets and I'll leave you alone. You leave me alone and I won't go telling anyone your secrets, you pervert, Rick concluded, disappearing again. Sounds like he had secrets that both Azumi and Nuke would be highly interested in, but he would say nothing of either. Hence, Nuke and Azumi clanked away at the tin seam all afternoon, ironically slaving away on behalf of a skeleton that wanted nothing more than to erase his memories of the time when such a relationship between man and machine was mandatory. This homely bout of conspiracy, perversion and manual labour was interrupted by a lone Shek arriving at the base. He was one of Estata's troops with bad news from Admag. I knew this would happen, Isaiah nodded. He pointed at a spot on the map hanging on the barrack wall. Those old fools couldn't let go. They'll be moving light and swift. Should be about here. By tomorrow, perhaps here. And then we shall have berserkers at our gates. And these Sheik can't be reasoned with, Wadston asked. I seriously doubt it, Isaiah said, shaking his head. I believe these will be the Sheik who were slated to battle the Bugmaster, but have had their valour and such stolen away. Stolen by the Prince and I, I suppose, so our heads are the new target for the last stand. We ended that though, right? Nuke said. Stone Zone said she was going to sort the whole death cult thing out. I know, but not everyone will listen, will they? You know how people can be. And we, Sheik, we're like how people can be all the time. How many berserkers are coming, you reckon? Izumi asked. There's no way to say. All we have is this rumour that they'd set off. Could be a thousand, perhaps only one hundred. Either way, we need a plan. A plan? Nuke scoffed. Wait, man, we've got the thousand guardians here, so a thousand crazies ain't nothing. And we're sitting on like a stack of choco bread. Brown pound, straight from the brown mound, day in, day out. What are they gonna do? But the canyon will trap us, Sandor warned. If things go wrong, we'll be out of luck. 
They could even blockade us in here and wait for the bread to run out. A siege? That would be terrible, Watson said, remembering the siege of Heft two decades prior in the war that brought a certain Tashino clan to power. Man, sounds like the battle to save the kingdom isn't over yet, Yuke said. We'll deal with the last of the old guard the hard way. They might attack us over the walls or trap us here, and we've got to be ready. Let's get down to business to defeat the Shek. Did they send me fleshies when I asked for mechs? Rick hummed to himself outside. His eavesdropping complete, he went back to his shed, confident that the battle to come was his to win. Out there, rushing towards them with unheard of speed, was a horde of angry belligerent Shek berserkers, lifelong warriors, eager to die in battle or die trying. Nuke's army braced themselves for the onslaught, preparing medical supplies and fresh beds, and of course sitting on burning campfires, after which the thought of getting a sword wedged into you didn't seem that bad. The morning of the battle came. I want to see ten and twenty, Gustafsson shouted to Nuke from the wall. Ten and twenty what? Units! Units of... Units of walking! I think he means to say... Jazz interjected. That he wants the 10 and 20 pace lines marked out in the approach. We've got a load of firewood left over from the squat and singe program, so let's light it up. The gate was opened up and Nuke started marking out the range lines while the archery experts calibrated their weapons up on the walls. But there was a loud jangling sound, then a load of scraping. Come on, you sons of guns, Rick said to the sack he was dragging across the gate threshold. Well, are you running away from home? Is this about future girl? We could share. I'm not that fussy man. What in the name of hell's old and new are you talking about? You can keep your slime ball girlfriend, thank you very much. Good luck with the... <laughs> well, you'll find out. Nothing much to worry about, all that. <laughs> anyway, I ain't going anywhere. In fact, I'm going to sort your shit out. Check it. Rick opened his clanking sack to reveal a legion of tin figurines. Wait, they can fight? Nuke asked. Kinda. Ask yourself this, my biological friend. If you rolled up on some outpost and saw it was guarded by a horde of strange little metal men, wouldn't you be a little worried they were up to something? But to clarify, they aren't actually up to anything. No! Well, I haven't kept that close an eye on them, but even then, the only thing they've been up... <laughs> Damn it, I said I'd let you find out the hard way. Uh, just move it, will ya? Rick laid out his army of tin men across the gates to the base. Each was about a foot tall, a featureless humanoid shape on a square stone base, with no moving parts and not even any sharp edges. Would this be enough to stop the horde? Rick, believing so, returned to his shed. Meanwhile, Nuke got the rest of the crew organized. Splitting the army into human, hiver, shek and crab companies, he positioned his forces ready to defend the sweet sands of Mank against whatever might come through that gate. The sun passed overhead. Midday. The canyon was silent, but for the steady clanging coming from Rick's shed. Then there was a raspy tone that echoed from the west. A war horn, Isaiah said. Thousand guardians, by the left, start pounding that mound. This strange order caused the Czech to inject their performance-enhancing starch. The ground began to shake as the berserker horde approached. It came down into the valley, and at last the guild saw them. They wore little, but carried huge two-handed greatswords. They cawed and whooped as they suddenly rushed for the walls, but then they fell silent and stumbled to a halt. The front ranks were staring at the Tin Man army. The Tin Man army, in its own way, stared back. Harpoons were slid into turrets, bowstrings drawn, crab claws flexed, yet all was still. It's... It's a little man, a berserker shouted, pointing at a model. There are l loads of them, another stuttered, looking around wide-eyed at the stalwart formation, four ranks deep and twelve inches high. They're small, and they can see us, a Shek panicked, dropping his blade and scrambling back through his comrades to escape. They can see us. Cries came from throughout the horde, and off they all went, desperately fleeing before the cold, fearless stares of their foes. Yep, 
that's really what happened. Maybe the Berserkers got their way and managed to die elsewhere, but it was not this day. Coin slot, you mad machine, get out here, Nuke called. Rick was pretty much dragged from his shed and hoisted up by the crowd of victorious biologicals. Just doing my part, letting you live, you know. Gotta make up for that old shit. I mean, uh, whatever, Rick said. So there we have it. The guild was saved from the aftershocks of what they did in the Shek Kingdom by the very distant aftershocks of what skeletons did in the transition from the First Empire to the Second, or whatever Rick did specifically. Perhaps learning to sculpt was part of it. As for rewarding Rick, he only wanted one thing. Thus, Nuke and Azumi went out for another afternoon on the tin mine. Strategically, Nuke led Azumi behind the main outcropping so that they could work out of view of the rest of the base. He had something very special he wanted to talk to her about. So you know, I've been thinking, he started. Azumi didn't dare prompt him further, just in case. I was thinking about me and you and our relationship. Now Azumi was quite on edge. Was this it? The thing she'd dreamed of and dreaded in equal measure? Was Nuke going to reveal that inner romantic that she was sure he had hidden away? I was thinking, he went on, that I should stop paying you. Ah. Azumi gave the tin vein a sudden very powerful thwack with her pick, then let out a long breath. Oh, I had no idea, Nuke. I thought I was... I thought we were working. I'm, I mean, I really did. It's okay, I can go back to back scratch, I guess. But... Nuke, you... <laughs> Unable to say more, she moved to leave, but Nuke's arms held her back. Wait, I mean, I want to stop paying you, so that it's not like I'm paying you to hang out with me, he explained. This wasn't a massive amount better, but surprisingly, he'd said something that didn't make it worse, so we can all appreciate that. What do you mean? I'm not here for my fucking guild salary. I know, that's good. So, I was thinking that you shouldn't just be my employee, you know? Like, I don't want to have you and Watston in the same category. Cool. That sounds... Uh, so what category am I in, precisely? I don't know. It's like its own category, with only you in it. Or, that's what I want. I mean, you have to volunteer to be in this category, so it's different to the other ones. Right. So this category, is that like a friend? A friend, but a friend of a certain category. You mean like a friend who is a boy? Kinda, close. I mean, that's pretty much... I don't want to say it's a contractually defined thing with like names and terms, blah blah blah, because it's, it's more like something that is happening just because you want it to happen. And you want it to happen? Yeah, that's why I asked you to mine tin with me. What a great reason to ask that. I know, right. So, what should we do now? I guess we just keep going. Keep mining tin? Uh, yeah? Oh, right. Yeah, better keep going. On the other side of the tin vein, Foran and Shamika were getting rather embarrassed eavesdropping on all this. This is weird. Should we get her out of there? Shamika asked. Don't you worry about that, Rick said from nearby. He stepped out from behind the finishing machine with an armful of freshly polished tin ingots. They've been like that since I knew them. Makes me sick, but that's biologicals for ya. It'll happen to you one day, too. <laughs> Reminds me, uh, you girls wanna help me take my mind off something? The girls looked at each other, shrugged, and disappeared into Rick's shed. Nuke and Azumi eventually reappeared, with barrows filled with extremely well-mined tin ore. They looked at each other and smiled just a little too long, then ran off to attend to all kinds of invented business. And hence, the cliffs of Manx and Canyon were witness to another anticlimax. None of the residents had any complaints, as in truth the matters of love and war had been settled, in one way or another. At the gates of the TCM Plus GHQ, Nuke stood before his crew for the usual pre-expedition inspirational speech. This isn't about drugs, he insisted. But, just so you have full disclosure, 
yes, we're going to the ruins of an ancient drugs research facility, and yes, I've run out of drugs, and yes, I want nothing more than to uncover the secrets of drugs of all colours. But this is not about drugs. This, my friends, is in the name of historical discovery. Future girls, half an old tome away from being the world leader in knowing what Red Rick keeps mumbling about. This is a noble quest that will literally, literally go down in history. Huh? You like that? No? And we, uh, if you do see any drugs or whatever along the way, uh, just let me know so I can uh, make sure it goes down in the future instead. Any questions? Where are we going? Els asked. Old drugs and history place. It'll be grand, Nuke assured him, and off they all went. Their destination was the Piston Police Narcotics Research Shelter. It was nestled in the steep hills southwest of the Great Swamp, and hence the guild was heading out via very familiar routes. They battled their way through the reavers and bandits of their home ranges. They battled the headless robots of Venge during the night, getting a little revenge for the abuse old farmer Lon had put up with on his little jaunt in the area. Then they battled the heavily unionized bandits of Shem, on account of passing through the region during reasonable business hours. From there, the easiest thing to do would be to go around the swamp to the other side, but Nuke accidentally led everyone through it, where he accidentally visited the tree tree and accidentally made certain capital investments. Man, these salesmen, he said with a shake of his head. You go in there for a swig of water and they upsell you to three, four, fifty keys of bloody hashish. Which this trip is literally the opposite of being about. Nuke, I don't mind if you want to buy that stuff, but on one condition, Izumi said. I will listen to your treaty. You have to stop being an ass. Literally, that's what this stuff is for. It's the makes you feel human juice. Juice? Swamp style, baby. Drinkable drugs. I like drink, El said. Then, Charlie, my boy, let's drink. You would buy into this stupid stuff, Izumi muttered. Don't neg the egg, Isaiah scolded her. By now, Els had downed a vial of the murky water Nuke had given him, which looked, smelled, and tasted a lot like swamp mank. It don't make me feel human, Els said, cut off by his face slamming into the ground. There he lay. Is he... dead? Izumi asked. No, that is what it's like to feel human, Nuke shrugged. So that means it's time for me to drag that dead weight into the future? Rick said. Into the past, we're off to the drugs museum, Nuke declared. Nuke, now in fully human form, led the way west. The west edge of the swamp was a little drier, with tall bluffs to clamber along, and only a smattering of wild blood spiders to contend with. They were soon on a well-trodden smuggling route south, which took them right to their destination. That's the place, the grid, Elena reported, looking up from the map. There was a passageway through the bluffs, in which the twisting, slimy branches of the swamp flora gave way to sheen, sharp, crystalline rocks. There was a tight way through into an extremely narrow valley, the sides made entirely of the shiny blue stone. There were several of these valleys cut into the shimmery cliffs, intersecting each other at right angles, creating the grid which the name on the map surely referred to. Unusual. Unbearable! Gustafsson commented, preferring not to look at the valley walls. This can't be natural, Izumi said. Natural as the planet itself. Came with it, Rick said. Came with it? Just what did you do this time? Nothing. Look for real this time. This shit is from the beginning, before I was a glint in some lazy human's eye. Just a mess up, as I recall. Some joker got their hands on the planet building stuff. What planet building stuff? Wait, you don't even know about that? <laughs> Shit, we hit all the good stuff, didn't we? Well, we'll see about that. Come on, let's look for remains of this piston police thing. Izumi waved for everyone to start searching the valleys. Crags would be a better word, for they really were no more than 20 meters wide. They were home to various thick-trunked trees with stymied pink leaves, but nothing more ferocious than that, luckily enough. 
Clearly something else had lived there before, as deeper into the grid were long metal shelters covering multi-story workstations. Incredible! Second Empire! Early Second Empire! No, even earlier! Look at these joints! Izumi said, examining the heavy plate metal construction. Elena took a look around and concluded, No, not First Empire, too crude. Not Second Empire, too sophisticated. This was built before the First Empire techniques were forgotten. That's amazing. I've never seen anything like it. Azumi was about to start climbing a ramp to get to what appeared to be the main section on the top level of the workshop, but Nuke held her back. Wait, wait, you don't know what's up there. Traps and shit. I'll look first, he said. That's part of being a tech hunter, Azumi complained. We'll share it. I'll hunt. You tech. Whatever. With this enthusiastic acceptance, Nuke got to work. Up on the top of the workshop, the rest of the guild couldn't see him, but they had some evidence he was still alive since he kept throwing little paper planes down. Unfolded, they revealed barely legible documents, mostly the intriguing chronicles of whose turn it was to order in fresh grog for the fleshies. While Azumi battled to keep this away from Rick, Nuke rifled around a variety of quite familiar machines. Second Empire tech was no different to what the United Cities, aka the Third Empire, aka the Second Empire but renamed and repopulated, had access to. To put this all another way, Nuke had no trouble breaking open all locks, bolts, intrays, outflows, nooks, crannies and crates. He found skeleton parts, rare tools, some very, very old trousers, but most importantly, he found a report on Hashish. A report that detailed precisely how the, and I quote, downright cheeky doom humes, end quote, created their magical makes you feel human stock cubes. It was the recipe for hashish, to be clear, and even through his grubby sun goggles, Nuke could see it. I had another accident, he called as he belted down the ramp to return to the guild, waving the hefty wad of papers over his head. That's great news, Prince Tashino, as I cheered. Nuke showed them all the documents explaining the details of Hashish production. With this, we could just brew the stuff in Dad's fucking attic, Nuke said. My prince, please, I think we should keep all criminal activity outside of the capital. At least outside of the palace, Wadston said. Criminal? Come on, Dad's asking for it. Or he did, like, months ago. He's definitely forgotten about it by now, but you know, when we show up, he'll be happy. Like, surprise, here's a load of drugs. And surprise, you have a son. Remember this guy? Allow me to analyze, Gustafsson asked. He looked over the plans, then all the other hivers looked over the plans, then he returned them with a bow. Hairy one wisdom. Efficient. We should implement these plans at once. Bad green wants the good green, so we're green to go, Nuke proclaimed. But seriously, guys, this trip isn't about blah 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 blah. Come on, we'll get the history done now. All seems safe. Let's hunt the tech and stuff. The guild spent the rest of the day and night there in the grid. There were plenty of other remains from the old research shelter, packed with technical documents carrying secrets to modern science, and random old notes that gave a fascinating insight into life 1500 years prior. Okrin's faceplate, Izumi remarked. Find something? Elena asked. Yeah, Okrin's faceplate. Look! It says someone was arrested for trying to vandalize Okran's faceplate. How can a god have a faceplate? I'm right here, ladies, Rick insisted. Rick, what is all this? Izumi asked, but the skeleton shook his head. Before I went down Black Desert City, there was no Okran. Someone thought him up along the way. Only one god in the Empire I left, the king. Stobe? Uh-huh. And... Could it be his faceplate? If I caught someone touching the big man, I'd do more than arrest him. But hey, maybe that's why they kicked me out. Kicked out of the Second Empire? It was all the Second Empire. You couldn't get kicked out of that back in the day. And you know, I seem to have forgotten all the details. I know. May I interrupt? Isaiah interrupted. Do I gather from this that you're saying, Rickard, that Ocran was just an imaginary god? But he's in the sky, Els pointed out. Look, I don't know shit about it. Biologicals can believe what they want. 
That's the only good thing they got that we don't, Rick said, quitting the conversation. My, first I've heard of all this. I mean, everyone always says Ocran is timeless. Prince Gustafsson, what do the Hivers know of this? Zyre asked. Your gods are false and irrelevant. We laugh at your delusion, was the reply. Oh, come now, that's rather mean. <laughs> I know. Will you say Ocran is real if I give you these three teeth? Yes! Go on then. Teeth is... Ocran is real. This is not a joke. Please transact now. As I had transacted, and aside from this little debate, a quiet and pleasant evening was had in the ruins of that piston police pad. Azumi successfully harvested a little collection of tidbits from the past. There was more where that came from though, she guessed, as the part of the world from the Grizz to the southwest coast was uninhabited and barely explored by the hunters. Plus, it was pretty. In the morning, the guild went up the far end of the grid and into the huge vale at the tail end of the spider plains. In the west, the arid, rocky ground began its rise up to the familiar horrors of Arak Mountain. In the east, a steep wall of ancient crystal rose sharply into what looked like a mountain from the base, but was in reality more of a hollow crater. Like the grid, this strange land predated even the First Empire, and was thoroughly untamed. To be more specific, it was packed from slope to summit with beak things. Similar to how the azure sands of gut back in the Empire seemed to attract the beasts, the mirrory crevasses of this huge blue crater really were a beak thing's thing. The guild then had to fight these beak things every hour or so as they tried to find any good archaeological burglary sites. After a day of trying, and nearly dying, they gave up and took an old road away from the crater, leading south into the boring brown hills of Shun. Shun had been extremely briefly a part of the United Cities Empire, but that was in the messy transition from Empire 2 to 3, and amid said mess, all the people living there had died or fled. Thus, the region was a little time capsule, left undisturbed in the corner of the world, shielded from colonization by Arak and the crater. Its last link to civilization was this dusty road that snaked around to the east, towards the fraying edge of the modern UC Empire. Given the history, and recent lack thereof, of Shun, you might expect there to be plenty of Archeo stuff to study, and you'd be dead right. I say this because the Tech Hunter expeditions to the area had encountered a little too much death to carry on. Why? No one knew. As such, Azumi was on edge the whole time. But it was really a pleasant, undisturbed march beside healthy rivers and rolling tan hills. Then, on the other side of the river, they came across a completely untouched Second Empire outpost. Nuke did his thing, and indeed the inside was full of goodies for his female, to quote, friend, unquote. It's really here. Everyone in Black Scratch always said the Shun Run was some impossible joke, Izumi said. Yeah, but to be fair, I heard Black Scratch is a level 3 narc zone, Nuke said. Their problem now. We can actually do this, Nuke. If I go back with what I have already, I'll get published for sure. If I bring back the treasures of the Shun Run, I'll be the only damn one who matters. Oh, well, that's good. Because you are. Not with those old fogies saying my stuff's too speculative. Not like we have... Oh, wait, did you mean, uh, I, I, I meant we're totally going to do the shun fun thing. Run. Don't mind if I do. With another so-called conversation masterfully handled, it seems a new plan was formulated. But first, the crew carried on east to get back to the Empire. It was time for a little R&R, &R, and Nuke was eager to pay his aunt a visit. This brought them to the breezy coastal flats on the southern edge of the world, which was home to Drifter's last. This walled town was proudly the edge of civilization. I know that title applies to most towns, but more specifically, this place was the furthest point in the Empire from the capital at Heft. Perfect place for a certain Emperor to send his claim to the throne possessing sister. Auntie? Auntie! Nuke called in the streets outside the biggest house in town. No response. Oi, Merrin! It's your only nephew! Merrin appeared on the roof, 
with a bottle of rum in each hand, peering down at the urchin below. New key? she asked. Yeah, it's me. Oh, uh, did I? You, you guys to get kicked out as well? Uh, yeah, actually. Nice. Now get fuck off, will ya? Fuck you off! What? I'm not allowed. Your Sammy men are here and they aren't supposed for us to be in talking. Away go! Go! Away! <laughs> However you say it. I'm... <laughs> Mary Merrin tripped over the roof edge, but Nuke managed to catch her. However, this meant that he was breaking some apparent rule. The Sammy men spirited Merrin back to her spirits and locked Nuke out of the noble compound. Dad set up some kind of kill switch here, Nuke said to Wadston in the bar. He must have been worried you would support Lady Merrin. He doesn't trust me. I fear it could be because of the laws you broke, my prince. What? It's the other way around. If he... Whatever, man. This really pisses me off, you know. I understand. You don't understand. Dad likes you. That's why he let you come out with me. I... that's not... Uh, I'm sure you're right, my prince. The equally exiled doctor conceded. I just wanna... Here I am on the other side of the world and he's still trying to tell me what to do and just generally screw me over. I feel like a fucking dreg again. Nuke, come on, Izumi said. Why don't we get out of this town? Can't make yourself feel human around here, right? Too bloody right. <laughs> Thanks, future girl. You get it, don't you? I don't think so, but I'm trying. Man, man, that's like even better. Is it? I don't know. Right, we're going on vacation. We're in the Riviera after all. Yes, after just one night in town, the guild was dragged out to go on Nuke's proposed vacation. Now I say dragged because everyone presumed this was just some weird way of saying they were going to brave feral beasts and raving lunatics in order to secure a piece of an old spoon that was once used by a legendary stoner. But nay, Nuke was seriously pissed by that whole Merrin thing and hence was seriously stomping towards what turned out to be a lovely seaside town. Or was lovely, probably. They went to the end of a spit southwest of town, where the ruins of an old fishing village sat astride sparkling, almost tropical waters, complete with skinny, knobbly beaches. Beach chapter, Nuke nodded to himself. What's a beach chapter? Els asked. Old Japaninan saying from the books, it just means something's good. Oh, so like, the bucket is beach chapter? The bucket is fucking beach chapter, Charlie. Enjoy it. Coin slot, can you recce the wet real quick? Nuke called. Sure thing. Finally get all that shit out of me. Rick muttered as he walked into the ocean. He wandered around in there for a bit, then returned to report that he hadn't seen any nasty fangs on the local wildlife. The spot was prime for a swim then. Everybody in, time to stink less, Nuke ordered. Stink of something else, rather, Isaiah corrected him. It was true that the seawater had a strange smell to it, lacking the salt and strong currents of earthly seas. It was more like a huge, silty lake in which life existed only in limited forms. The scary remains in those bone fields were a testament to ancient attempts to get something going but no dice. Anyway, while you can debate whether swimming in the sea made you stink more or less, and everyone did, you can't argue that it wasn't a pleasant feeling to bob around in the endless, unforgiving, all-consuming ocean. Wait a minute. Yes, the guild came to the conclusion that swimming on the literal edge of reality was not all that relaxing, so they retired to a little inlet just along the coast. It had a deep end, a shallow end, minimal chance of a kraken, and was flanked by a load of twiggy palm trees, perfect for a campfire. What ensued was quite possibly the most pleasant scene of the previous Ocran knows how many thousand years. On that lonely stretch of nowhere, everyone could enjoy a warm night beneath the stars and beside the pool. Miscellaneous meats were mined from Gary's greasy bags and roasted up on the campfire. The Shek practiced their swimming, which was certainly needed, and the Hivers could appreciate being between the water and the trees, just like in their old hives. 
On the shore, Izumi looked up at Okran and Narko, becoming more brilliant in the sky as night fell. Narko's grey surface was stained by dark patches of charred dust and the shadows of huge impact craters. Okran's seas shone blue, and its land was a quiet, icy white. You know, there's something I don't get, Nuke said, walking up to her. I... that's very surprising. It's those two up there. Imaginary gods, whatever, real question is. If it's dark now, why can we still see them? Well, Nuke, first think, why is it even dark here? Uh, because the light ball moved away. Kinda. Yeah, I mean, that'll do. It moved away from us, but not away from... the uh, Okran and Narco. Earth and Moon, if you want to use the scientific names. I don't. And also, I don't get it. It's like... Azumi moved to stand by the campfire. See how now the light's on that side, my front is dark? But you, from my perspective, still look light. Wait, let me see that, Nuke said. He moved over to where Azumi was, but alas, when he looked back, he was no longer where Azumi had seen him. It doesn't work if you're in my shadow. You're too... uh, close, Izumi said. Come to think of it, Nuke had moved rather into Izumi's personal space. They could smell the musky seawater in each other's hair. Oh dear, this was far too much. Oi, you party animals need any supplies? A voice called from the darkness. Salvation. Nuke rushed over to deal with them and found it was a caravan of traders who'd come to investigate the lights. As it happened, the guild was fine for everything, but these wanderers were selling a couple of old books with pictures of Okran on the cover. Nuke paid whatever and brought them back to the fire. Present, he mumbled, handing them over to Izumi. Thanks. I didn't... Oh, it's the thing I was saying about. It's called astronomy. Let's see... Oh, wait a minute. It's not English or Japanese. This is French. Ah, French. The one they call the language of love. Rick commented from a nearby bush. You better read it to get an understanding of it. Don't mind me, I ain't listening. Not at all. Zuda fuggin' law. So, you don't know what it says? Nuke asked. No, but I know what it's saying. Nice. Shall we, like, look at the pictures and you can explain it? Uh, yeah. Take a seat. Where? Where? Where shall I sit? Next to me? Oh, right. Yeah. It was all going great, let me tell you. The night went on, and most folk lay out in the sand to grab some sleep. Rick, on sentry duty, was joined in the waking world only by Nuke and Izumi, whom he stared at nervously from his bush. Man, I guess I do get it, Nuke nodded, lying. Good. It makes you see the world differently, you know. Once you understand a little about how it all works, it just makes sense. You can get why stuff happened and guess what's going to happen next. Nice. So you're like, future girl then? Yeah. But that wasn't why... Why did you start calling me that? Uh, I don't know. Wasn't it like because I was trusting you with the future or something? Maybe. But I was going to say that if you trust me, you could just call me Izumi. Nah, lame. Is it? Everyone else calls you that. I can't be like them. Is this that whole, you can't pay me because you pay Wadston and I'm not like him thing? Uh, probably. Right. So just keep calling me girl then. No, I mean, I want to call you like... Izzy. Izzy? It's a bit... Uh, hissy. I was going to say a bit sweet. Sweet, but it's like meant to be like sweet or something oh then you did it well done thanks izzy izzy girl izzy my friend who is a you know it's quite late yeah probably we should get some sleep yeah probably how do you what's the best way lie down like here yeah while I'm still next to you. I mean, anywhere. Oh, here's as good as anywhere. Night. Good night, Nuke. And one more thing. Sorry I don't have a sweet name for you. Sorry, right. it's uh, kind of my thing anyway. Well, just so you know, I do want to call you 
My friend, my friend of a certain category. Bit of a long name. Yeah, I'll save it for special occasions. Should be plenty. Yeah, I bet. Let's sleep then, Azumi said, commencing the process of pretending to be asleep all night next to someone who was doing the same. Rick had received too many faulty inputs and crashed and had to reboot, so for once he actually did sleep. My, my, what a night. The next day they'd be off into the wilds of Shun to discover the great mysteries of history, including why precisely all the tech hunters who went there before never returned, and, much more crucially, the properties of the unique friendship category Nuke and Azumi had assigned to each other. Rick's gonna love this. The far distant reaches of Shun were long since abandoned by civilization. And you know what they say, nature abhors a vacuum. That vacuum was thus filled with large, blood-sucking spiders. Nature, why are you like this? Yes, our heroic guild were forced to battle the locals of a second empire outpost, but the prize was worth it. The iconic mushroom-shaped buildings were in terrible condition and hence less mushroom-shaped and more pile-of-blown-up rubble-shaped. Structures like these didn't collapse on their own, and nor did the Second Empire. Artifacts and written documents were hidden in every corner of these ruins, and thus the better part of the day was spent there collecting them up. It was a simple team effort. Izumi did all the work, while everyone else kept their hands, feet and will to delete away from the precious treasures at all times. They were experimenting with something here, Izumi concluded from her findings. It's all talking about feeding and reproduction rates. Experimenting, huh? Nuke nodded. Of animals, they were raising creatures to try and get them into the wild. Can't really tell what. Just says things like test subject W345. Whatever it is, it didn't stick around, I imagine, Elena said. Yep. No evidence left, I heard. No abominations or whatever. A scientists like them wouldn't have accidentally called anything with four legs a damn spider, so we know there's nothing there, Rick reasoned. Nuke, can you do your thing? Izumi asked. Nuke went over to the one building that was still in pristine condition, with its hydraulic door firmly locked. There's something written here, he reported. It says, speak, friend, and enter. Fucking nerds, Rick called in the distance. Ah, uh, must be a riddle or something, Izumi said. Nah. <laughs> friend, enter. What? I said friend, and enter? Is that not it? No, it's probably some secret word. Secret word. Oh, I get it. Nuke pulled Izumi closer to the door and put an arm around her. Izumi wasn't sure Nuke had actually got anything, but wasn't complaining so far. Then, he said, A door, look, this is my Tomodaiki, who is a girl. You mean, your Kenajo? Uh, I... Oh, yeah. The door was opening there and then. Second Empire was a weird time. Oh, by the way, Kenajo really does mean friend who is a girl. Although, a more apt translation might take the first and last words aside, reverse them, and just go with that. It sounds like Azumi had been having a cheeky read of the guild's custom-translated ancient literature. Given that she was now entering a quiet library with Nuke-kun, those tales must have been foremost in her mind. That would explain why she seemed so nervous as she rifled through the drawers, shelves and boxes, bagging random books and folders without looking at them. Phew, uh, Izzy, why don't you come up and take a look at this? Nuke called from upstairs. Izzy was experiencing a very bad case of Doki Doki now. If you don't know what that is, then what can I say? You haven't read the classics, have you? Enough of this, it was all business really. Nuke had found a big map of the area from the pre-abandonment days. It seemed to indicate that the headquarters for the Creature Creation Program was on a plateau to the northwest. This will be the perfect place to find what we want, Nuke said, saying it of a spot on the map, of course. Yeah, it's so isolated. There won't be anyone there to stop us getting to the truth, will there? Izumi said. Still speaking of the archaeological stuff. Although she was edging awfully close to her senpai. So, uh, is... E. 
Izzy, my friend. I wanted to... Nuke muttered. Yeah, sorry about what happened last night. Wait, what happened? I was asleep the whole time. Oh, me too. I meant before that. I was being weird. No, no, it was fine. I don't mean to be a Sundaner, you know. What? Well, you know what that is? I've been reading. I... <laughs> you're not a Sundary. You're... I don't know. Just you. Just... Izzy. Nuke. Call me that again. Anything you want. Izzy. Oh, fucking hell. Azumi said, before doing something very untoward. What? I don't know, do I? This all happened in private. Can't we just let them have their little night in the library? And it was all night, by the way, with the rest of the guild camping out in the ruins around it, daring not approach that temptingly still open door. Only Rick's microphones were sensitive enough to detect the truth. Nuke stumbled out of that door amid the first hints of dawn, and started frantically clapping his hands. All right, rise and shine, my lovely people, it's time to make history even better, he declared. Happy evening, Prince, Isaiah asked. History's just really good, Nuke said, quickly marching off. Izumi shambled out of the library shortly, greasy as ever. Gustafsson took one sniff at her, then turned away defiantly. Unworthy association. Foul, he said. Huh, <laughs> you're jealous, El said of him. Let's hope it was just an idle-minded remark and not a true assessment, because if it was true, then this is just getting far too complicated. The guild went off towards that hot spot on the map. On the way, they came across an old storehouse, upon which Nuke's magic was worked and entry was gained. Perhaps wanting to prove something, Gustafsson went in first for once, followed by his gang of Ronin soldiers. Inside, they got the first taste of why the tech hunters had given up on this part of the world. The building was guarded by a squad of Second Empire security spiders. These were similar to the iron spiders the guild had bested in the wild, only they were smaller, faster, and downright angrier. All of the hivers were out cold by the end of it, and one was missing a leg. Several Shek were groaning on the floor, and even poor Watston was out for the count. It was quite the brawl, and this was just some rusty old cliffside outpost. If it was that heavily defended, what might those Second Empire weebs have left guarding their giant headquarters, up to which the guild hobbled that evening? It was Ninja Nuke's job to check. The building was a large citadel, in the same fashion as the one used by the Bugmaster up on the mountain, but in far better condition. In fact, it was in perfect condition, despite the centuries out in the desert. Nuke soon spotted the caretakers to blame inside. The whole facility was packed with two things. Pristine ancient machines and relics, worth more than their weight in mank, and crazed swarming security spiders, aka the legendary less giant robot crabs. One of them clocked Nuke peeking in through the windows and chased him all the way down the long exterior ramp back into the desert. It didn't stop them, clattering into the guild with its spiky appendages flailing with motorized force. It gave everyone quite a beating before it finally whirred to a halt. When you're fighting something made of metal with a sword, there just isn't a huge amount you can do, especially with the low ground clearance on the things. Nuke's secret critical twist technique wasn't viable. What's the prospect? Isaiah asked. It's packed full of the good stuff, and shitting crawling with the bad stuff, Nuke breathlessly reported. Clearly this is a piece of history we aren't meant to see. Shall we carry on elsewhere? Wadston suggested. Nuke shook his head. Man, this is it. This is everything we need. One last big job. Not that I've ever... Uh, wait. Izzy, you explain. Wait, not that she... Because of the history. Ah, shit, we're staying all right. We'll figure something out. Thus the great siege of Shun began. That night, Nuke went up for another peek inside. The other spiders on the first floor weren't as watchful as the earlier one, and so he managed to actually get inside. The pristine tools and machines were his to touch, and those webless spiders were none the wiser. He crept up the ramp to the second floor, where even more valuable and exciting machines sat, humming away even after a thousand years or more of standby. 
but there was a security spider at the top of the ramp that Nuke had to get past to spy any more secrets. It was facing the other way, but as Nuke tried to step around it, a crumb of chocolatey starch fell from his messy stubble. It landed right in front of the spider, which buzzed to life and immediately pinched the crumb into its mouth. Calorific content exceeds recommendation. Suggested approach to reconciliation. Execution without trial for all humans. The spider's dusty speaker reasoned. Oh dear. Nuke tried to leg it, but tripped on the spider's leg and whacked himself out cold on the floor. Still, the spiders had booted up for blood, and so a few went looking for targets outside. The guild camp was there for the taking. But after a hard fight, the spiders were held down and stripped of their vital parts. It was the dead of night, and with half the guild now moaning of cuts and bruises, it was almost possible to miss the fact that Nuke hadn't come back. But after all the situation Azumi had endured, she wasn't going to forget him that easily. Nuke, are you okay? She shouted up at the towering lab. In that instant, Nuke woke up on the cold steel. Nuke, please come back, say something, the shouting went on. Nuke scrambled over to a window, ignoring the spiders around him, and called back. Don't worry, Kanajo, I'm good. Danger, otaku language detected. Engage combat protocols, a voice said from speakers throughout the lab. Oh dear. Nuke barreled down the ramp and sprinted back outside, chased by another cluster of angry arachnomorphs. They called me an otaku, Nuke complained, but there was no time for semantic analysis. The spiders crashed through the barely standing guild, and this time it was very much touch and go. The spider's whirling bludgeons touched your arm, and off it goes. Ruka of the Thousand Guardians watched her sword fly off in her former right hand, but immediately pulled a dagger with her left and bashed at the nearest spider casing. Eventually, each spider bot was torn a few new ports, and the fighting was over again. Please stop going in there, my prince, this is too much, Watson said, struggling to raise his head off the ground. Nuke, one of the few still standing by the end of it, agreed. The next day of the Great Siege was spent with everyone laying up under a few tall trees nearby, covered all over in gauze and splints. All the while, Nuke was sat in the dirt, looking up at the tower. My man, was this what those old sieges were like? He asked Wadston. Not quite. You couldn't set up a field infirmary like this in the desert. Skimmers wouldn't have it. Oh yeah, the skimmers. Remember when we used to get beaten up by those guys? Yes, my prince, quite well. Makes you think about how far we've come. I don't follow, my prince. Now we're being beaten up by robot spiders. That's way cooler. Ah, from that perspective, perhaps life has improved, Watson conceded. But would it not be better to remain relatively healthy and intact? Ah, my man, you are old but not wise. If we do not have monsters to fight, then we must grapple with the monsters inside our souls. Ah, you mean self-doubt, for example? I mean that I'm not a damned otaku. That stupid building thinks it knows me, Nuke burst out. And uh, what is an otaku exactly? You still haven't read the classics. It's like someone who never gets a beach episode, but must always dream of it. Is that bad? It's the fucking worst. It's as bad as calling me a loser. Wait, the building called you a loser? Isaiah said. That's nonsense. I know, Nuke shouted. That's it. I'm sure we've killed them all now. I'm taking another look. That was on the morning of the third day which for reasons entirely unrelated, was the third time Nuke came running out of the lab with cantankerous clankers in tow. Another fight, and still no one had managed to die, but everyone was certainly thinking about it after all these terrible beatings. Some of the hivers were comatose, hardly anyone could walk, and the stashes of painkillers and bandages had been run dry. Only a hero could rescue this ailing army from peril, and a hero they had. Well, watching you fleshies get it handed to you has been great, but I'm gonna help you out here, Rick said. Rick, don't tell me you can control those things, Izumi asked. 
control. Oh, I get it. Just cause I'm a robot, I must be friends with all other robots. Damn, you gotta get out more, sister. Sure, I access them. Wait, wait, look, I'm not going there. It's just rude, man. Just straight up rude. Ain't touching your firewall, ain't touching theirs. You hear me? Technically, I can hear you, but it's not really helping. I'm saying I'll hook you up with some beds for your bruises and shit. I don't know, back in a flash. Rick thudded off into the dawn and ran with superhuman speed back to Drifter's last. There, he purchased a load of camping gear and returned it to the siege. With camp beds, fresh medical supplies and the finest homemade booze the Empire's back alleys had to offer, the next couple of nights under the stars passed much less painfully. In fact, most were back on their feet now, and laying about was getting boring. Right, shall I do it again? Nuke asked. Oh, go on then, Isaiah said, waving his guardians into formation. Nuke popped up to the tower and stood proudly in the main doors. Hello everyone, I am well versed in Japananan literature, he said. The spiders scanned him curiously, but didn't move. No? I mean, I really like those pictures. Still nothing. Nuke huffed and pulled a light novel from his bag. It opened with well-worn ease onto a particular page spread, featuring a hilarious incident of semi-accidental groping. This is Mikuru-chan, and while we don't live in the same dimension, I believe we share a strong romantic bond, but I'm not an otaku, Nuke declared. That did it. Critical degeneration detected. Eliminating parasite vector, the voice said. Nuke had some more spiders to show his three-dimensional friends, and an epic battle with the power of teamwork and so on was had. With this, all the spiders on the first floor of the lab were out of action. Next, Nuke went up to the second level, where a couple more awaited. Hey backers, check this out, he said, running across the room with a stooped posture and his arms outstretched behind him. For reasons known only to cultured literati and the killer robots that hunt them, this threw the spiders into a rage. They came out to face the guild as well then, and by now, the crew were getting the hang of pinning the deadly appendages down while someone found the off switch. There was only one spider left in the lab, and after it too wandered out to its demise, the siege of Shun was over. Victory! Nuke shouted. Fucking hell, everyone alive? Izumi asked. Apparently so. With that confirmed, she suddenly felt more nervous than she had felt during the fighting, and about half as nervous as she had been when Nuke... never mind that. Now was time to collect the spoils of war. The upper level of the lab had a number of storerooms, and as Nuke and Izumi hacked open old containers, they found reams of printouts, masterfully built machine parts, and things even rarer. Holy shit, Nuke! It's an uninstalled core! Izumi shouted, pulling a lumpy blue sphere out of a box. Nice! We could roll it at coin slots tin men and see how many we get each time, Nuke suggested. But as Azumi explained, these AI cores were more likely to turn the tin men into fully fledged living beings than knock them over. These are what the Second Empire used to make their soldiers. It's got remnants of the First Empire tech that built the skeletons. These are... We have to study this, Nuke. This could change everything. In what way? It can decode the oldest data. All this data, all these pages, if we get this to Enrico, we're done. I'll be the best tech hunter of all time. And the drugs? Nuke, if you can get me and this core to the scribes in one piece, I'll get them to draft a green machine plan from those notes you found. No problem now that we've got this. Kind of a waste of the greatest scientific discovery in 2000 bloody years. But hey, gotta test it out on something. Fuck. Izzy, we're literally the best team. It's all you, Prince, I assure you. And it's all for you, Is, I assure you. <laughs> Thanks. I've got a good feeling about this. Speaking of good feelings, before we go back out... Nuke, the core. What? It's literally watching. What? Fog, how'd you know? The core said, sounding suspiciously like Rick. Disconnect, Rick. Ten stacks. Twenty, now fuck off. Izumi grabbed a sheet and threw it over the core then grabbed another and threw it over Nuke. 
with precious pages of ancient books littered all over the floor, Azumi seemed more interested in the present than history. And to be fair, that particular present was quite a lot more interesting. Who connected me to this? What is that sound? The AI core said in Enrico's voice, but Nuke and Azumi, being closer to the source of that sound, didn't clock the intrusion. So, the week-long struggle for control of the lab had left the guild loaded up with ancient treasures and knowledge worth far more. Now their return to civilization might just bring about, well, a return to civilization, more broadly speaking. But that is pie in the sky thinking. Even if these discoveries would only lead to a revolution in drug production, that was more than enough. Gary and Garrett were weighed down with all kinds of boring grey treasures. Cold to the touch, dull to the eye, and worth more than all the cats in the world. With the plunder of the forgotten land of Shun secured, the guild returned back home. They were going to travel back via Admag, seeing as it was nearby, and this route took them around the southern perimeter of good old Mount Doom. There they stumbled upon some more Second Empire ruins, adding yet more wordy, papery booty to the pile. After they turned north to enter the Shek Kingdom, they came upon a curious scene. Along the east slope of Arak there were camps filled with mercenaries and bounty hunters. One waved Nuke over as the guild sauntered in. That's quite the crew you got, going after the Bugmaster then? The man asked. Bugmaster? Yeah, I heard he has quite the treasure up there. Oh, I've heard no end of it. That's why all the chances you'll ever want are here going for it. Only thing is, I've heard no one's ever gone up there and lived. <laughs> kind of just waiting for the right moment, you know. I know exactly, precisely, my man. Good luck. Nuke returned to the guild and beckoned them onwards. Shouldn't we tell them the truth, my prince? Watchton asked. Watchton, why are you so insensitive? Think how disappointed we were when we found that shitty treasure. Well, excluding the bug men. Those guys came all the way up here, made their little camp, stressed themselves out over this, and you want to tell them that the treasure is just fucking teeth, and that Bad Green's eaten most of them. The Garu ate them, Gustafsson quickly insisted. Watson got Nuke's so-called point, and they all left the bounty hunters to their placebo quest. They travelled on to Admag, where they could enjoy a little shopping and such after this long campaign. While dropping in to visit Azaya's folks, they actually did see the Bugmaster, caged on the royal barrack. He shot Nuke a gleaming white smile and waved him over. Champion, getting justice is down to you now. Don't let those robos get away with their disgusting schemes, he said. The guards rushed over and gagged him. Speaking was against the rules, of course, and so Nuke just wandered off with that mysterious request in tow. Outside, Gustafsson had been chatting with a local livestock trader. When the guild assembled to leave, he proudly held his purchase up before them. Behold! Ass! he shouted. Well, it was actually a goat, and a tiny pup of a goat at that. Bad Green, you gonna be the new goat king? Nuke asked. Never! However, this offering will one day win his favour. So, to win his favour, you're going to give him your ass. Precisely! A tried and tested method, Nuke shrugged. Gustafsson followed him, ass and all, as they set out. They walked east for the next two days until they finally arrived back at the Techscribe headquarters on the far side of Shun. There, while Ruka browsed replacements for her missing arm, and Gustafsson showed his cute miniature goat off to all the fawning bookworms, Behold! Ass! Nuke and Azumi gathered up all the history and prepared their pitch to Enrico. Have you actually read all this? Nuke asked. There were hundreds of pages of miscellaneous primary sources and loads of books, diagrams and digital knickknacks all on top of that priceless AI core. Well, I was meant to read it all, just in case they covered it up or something, but I got distracted. What by? By you. Oh uh, yeah, not really a wrong choice though, is it? We'll see, carry these. Nuke was given a pile of old maps, and the very first one was actually pretty juicy. This is... it's battle diagrams, he said. 
Look, there's a border, and the shaded bit's next to the picture of an eye. An eye or the eye? So where it says, control tower? Ockrens, tablespoon, you just did some history. You should call me history boy. What? What? Whatever, take off that hat and let's do this. Inside Enrico's office, aka the bar, the pair let the archivist flip through their hall and stroke the outside of their AI core. I don't know, probably an academic thing. This is the most comprehensive collection I have ever seen. It is intact. We have the war between the humans and the skeletons, the war with the Earth clans. This one is quoting original First Empire sources. This is... this is... Historic? New Coffered? Histrionic! Enrico called with a swoop of his hands. What's this human skeleton war? Izumi asked. Oh, it's all quite dramatic. Humans, skeletons, just very different creatures. There is nothing here about why they were fighting. Well, technically it's all up here in the old cop since I was there after all. But this is not enough to unforget it. Yes, there was much back and forth, much talk of one Stobe fellow that definitely rings a bell. Oh, and I think the skeletons won, but humans are still here, so maybe the whole thing was rained off in the end. I don't know. We'll get the monkeys to read it all and write it up. That's fascinating, I think, Izumi nodded. But what about all these technical documents? This is ancient technology, isn't it? Yes, yes it is. This will take years to reverse engineer. But I have years. I have years by the fucking boatload. Wait, Enrico, these discoveries are mine, don't forget. Yours? These documents are for the good of all the creatures in the world. You can't own them. But we had to go through some real shit to get these. And everyone else went through real shit without them, my greasy sister. But actually, I do have an idea. How about you can keep all the glory and whatnot if you do all the work? Gladly. This is the most important endeavor of my lifetime, and your lifetime. Oh, you say that, but I was there with this whole sliced bread thing. What's that? Lost technology, pay it no heed. Now your little fellow has been staring at me for some time, and I think I would like to have him killed. Do you object? No, he's my... free... Uh, boy... assistant. You know about science, boy assistant? I know that the appliance of science is drugs, Nuke chimed. Oh, you really do know it. Okay, you're in, Pink Eyes. You've got a lot of work ahead of you. Enrico ended up piling a load more books, tools, and mechanical relics onto the guild so that Azumi could analyze them for her magnum opus of a paper back home. Act 1 of the opus was to be a drugs machine, but with all these resources, she could probably get some even more valuable patents to her name. However, going home would require crossing Venge, and crossing Venge would mean walking very near to Nuke's little historical discovery. It was mid-afternoon, and the laser was happily spurting around the desert, but with everyone eager to get home soon, they were convinced to follow Nuke out into the danger zone. Clearly they'd all earned a little luck, as they made it to the so-called control tower without being eviscerated. Up they went to loot up and shelter before nightfall, but at that very moment their luck ran out. The place, as it turned out, was being used in the modern era as a central base for the legions of headless skeletons the guild had scuffled with previously. These leftovers from that human skeleton war still remembered their programming, and immediately everyone was battling the skeleton army amid the messy workshop on the tower's first floor. Red Rick wandered about amid the action, and spotted two particular skeletons that still had their heads attached. He tried to duck out of their view, but they'd already seen him. Hi, Red Rick, is that you? One called. Hey, hey, if it ain't Scream of the False, still doing that screaming thing these days? Nah, the speaker's got torched by the eye. Shame, guessing this ain't really the control tower then. What are you talking about? Oh, you remember Ponk, don't you? The first headed skeleton introduced a second headed skeleton, who gave a strange, jerky bow. Gombanwa Rikutaisho, it said. Yep, I remember him. We sent him over so you would kill him, you know. Oh, I think he's cute. 
Anyway, do you still have your stick? Yep, don't leave the dome without it. <laughs> Remember when there used to be all those domes? Those were good times. We used to beat the fleshy so much. Will you join me now, old friend? Can't really do that. You see, I'm kind of with these fleshies right about now. With them? Is that a biological or sexual thing? Oh, sometimes. Try not to think about it. So what, are you going to give me the stick? Yep, not a sexual thing, mind you. Sorry, man, times are changing. Rick whipped out his big stick and started swinging. The skeleton goons were beaten into hibernation, and the ones with heads, while much more skilled on account of having eyes, eventually got a bit too much system shock too. After exploring the tower, it turned out there was one more skeleton on the scene, locked in a cage in the corner of a storage room. I don't believe it. They didn't kill any of you, did they? Rick said. This skeleton is broken, Elena commented. No shit. This whole place was meant to be where the broken fellas got recycled. Seems old Screamer was just turning them into his personal army. Do you think we could repair him? Not really. This guy's Agnew. He was a knight, but it weren't battle that took him down. Ghosts in the machine got the better of him. Happened to a few guys. Give the biologicals too much stick and something just kicks in. Probably their fault. But you can't get around the feelings. What feelings? More like a sense, a doubt. It was something all right. And sometimes thinking about it got you caught in a loop. That's why it's best not to think about it at all, or you'll end up like Agnew. Agnew was shaking about in his cage and was grunting and growling in short bursts. It seemed that was all he could say. Should we let him out? Elena asked. Only if you're gonna shut him down. Code Lupin's no way to live. I would never do that. Then don't you do anything. With that, Agnew was left in his little cage while the guild started picking out some choice pieces for analysis. It wasn't as fertile as the Shun lab, but the tower was still packed with old books and curious gizmos to loot. Only problem was that while everyone was sorting through the mess, Els had wandered over to Agnew's cage. <coughs> Agnew said. Oh, don't worry, I can hear you, Els replied. <coughs> Agnew went on. If you promise to follow the rules, although one rule is you're not allowed to listen to me, so maybe that means you don't have to follow the rules. Wait, uh... <coughs> you're stuck in a loop too? Loop friends! Some bloody elves' magic was worked on the cage door, and open it swung. Agnew stepped out, looked around at the aghast guild, and declared, He says thanks, Els reported. Rick, is this alright? Izumi asked. Well, if Eggman can speak machine code, then we're fine. Otherwise, we're about to get beaten up by a wild, glitched-out biobash knight. The second thing didn't happen, so the first thing must be true? It seems impossible, but that appeared to be what was happening. Once all the looting was done, it was the middle of the night, which of course is the perfect time to cross Venge, so off the guild went. They had tied up Screamer and Ponk to take back into the Empire, but this unfortunately caused all the hidden companies of their thrall soldiers to emerge from the rocks and harry the guild at every turn. They were in a constant state of battle along the road north, with this biobash knight Agnew getting stuck right into it. It was likely meant to be a quest for revenge, but bashing these non-bio opponents proved difficult for him, mainly because every movement he made was immediately interrupted by a decision to make another. The strange ancient dance that resulted was quite fascinating, but far from deadly. The guild eventually prevailed and fought their way up to the eye, the grounded one, that is. Agnew rode on Rick's shoulders, where he was almost as high as the beak things that greeted them on the Empire's frontier. Was the world trying to conspire to keep Azumi from unpacking all the secrets she had gathered? Or was Nuke just navigating them into beak thing nests because he had one eye on the latest ancient picture book he'd swiped? 
It's almost certainly one and not the other. But let's compromise and say it was Wadston's fault. Eventually, they all arrived in Brink, where Screamer the False and Ponk were clanked down in the police station in exchange for hefty rewards. A good 2,000 years as wanted terrorists racks you up quite the bounty. Sorry guys, but war's over, you know. Ended a while ago, actually, Rick said to them. You gone soft, you gone fleshy men. Did you forget what they did? Screamer said. Yeah, I did, actually, and things are going just fine. You can sit in a cage like my main man here and think about what you did for a couple of thousand. Maybe you'll work it out. Jokes on these fleshies. I'll just shut down and then wake up when I'm free. See you then, Red Rick. No, you won't. Rick Daisho. Aishiteru. Ponk said. Yeah, yeah. Rick waved, and the bots were carried off into custody. From Brink, it was a short walk back out of the Empire and into Reva territory, then a short battle with them to avoid paying the tolls, then a short, groaning hobble down the hill into Maxand Canyon. The Tin Man army stood proudly guarding the main gate, and watched with austere discipline as the crew filed in and collapsed into bed. It was four in the morning, after all. But someone was too excited to sleep. Azumi started dragging all the bits and bobbles into her office, stuffing her library with new books and arraying the machine parts and AI goodies on a workbench. So, future girl, did you... Oh my fucking phoenix! Jazz exclaimed as she dropped in for her usual update. She was a tech hunter as well, it's easy to forget, and knew exactly how unprecedented Azumi's haul was. Too important to talk to you right now, Azumi said. Fuck off! This is great! You got like the whole Scratch collection in here! And more! Is that an AI core? Yes, it is. And yes, she did, the core said. Rick, stop it! My work is done here. I'll be in the shed. Sorry, it's still active. Ocran's nobbles! Are you for real? Jazz asked. Really for real. An unused AI core. This can analyze all these pages for us and decode the secrets of the Second Empire, and maybe even earlier. Great, but who cares? Did you really get with Prince Ponce? He and I have formed a very successful partnership. What the fuck is that? Are you really, really ain't never gonna say it? Nope, now fuck off. Scientific revolution can't wait for jealous friends. Oh no, that's the last fucking straw. I'm gonna go slobber on that prince right now. No, wait. I knew it! I mean, I... Do what you want. Please just be nice about it. Nice as the Manx and Morn, my love. I'm happy for you, shit for brains. Don't worry, I'll keep to slobbering on Big Stick Rick instead. If you're done with him, that is. Done and rusted. Fuck off. Jazz complied. The next day, the real work began. New Kazumi and Elena started the mammoth task of reverse engineering old technology from incomplete sketches and descriptions, helped along by the ball of general artificial intelligence Nuke was rolling about on the desk. Yes, Nuke wasn't the best analyst, really, but he couldn't be torn away from that most important of initial tasks, designing the green machine. The hard fighting was over, and the hard writing began. But this intellectual battle would be far more decisive, as now the TCM Plus Guild would begin to unravel the ancient, illegal, and highly profitable secrets of long-lost societies, and in doing so, gain the power to change the world forever. Change it for the better? Ah, uh, no comment. <laughs>